Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone here to our regular meeting. Um, in accordance with South Carolina Tree Roof Information Act, Section 3480-E, South Carolina Code 1987 is amended. All the media and media area have been notified of the date, time, location, and agenda of the meeting. This time we have our prayer by Mr. Govan. Let's bow our heads. Father, we ask that you continue to bless us. We ask God that you will allow us to have the meeting that is pleasing in your sight. We ask that you will allow us to take the eye out and the we or us in. We ask that the decision we make will be in the best interest of our children and the citizens of Dalton County. This we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I now ask for approval of the agenda. Who do you approve? Second. Okay. Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approval of the agenda? Aye. Uh, Aye. Uh, Aye. Uh, have it. Moving on to the citizens' comments. We have one person uh, signed up tonight. I'm going to read the guidelines for citizen participation. The first 30 minutes of the monthly meeting will be set aside for three minute input sessions for citizen participation. Participation will be approved on a first come, first talk basis and recording on a log which is provided. Public input should be in the form of suggestions, information, or comments pertaining to programs, schools, or the school district. Based on legal advice of our council, comments should not be made either complimentary or critical, naming a student, school employee, administrator, or board member, as these matters are personnel matters that require an executive session. Speaker's comments will be received only as board information. We have one person signed up tonight, uh, Mr. Dwayne Duke. He's mayor of Society Hill. Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dwayne Duke. I am the mayor of Society Hill. I'm here on behalf of suggestions and just comments about Rosenwald Elementary School. I am the new mayor. There is a new energy in Society Hill. And I, I know that um, we are going to go forward, Society Hill is going to go forward, I'm, I, I know that. Because of the people that's behind us, because of the, just, even the school, when I went into school, I visited the school the other day during awards day. And as I visited the school and spoke to all the teachers and spoke to the teachers, uh, the, the students and the staff, I told them that I, I was going to work hard to see that their job stayed and the students' school stayed open. We have community people coming together for the garden that's going on, the little garden that they have, for um, the Lions Club, there's an arts program in the Lions Club. I'm a welder by trade, that's, that's what I'm a welder by trade, a builder. I've been in a lot of schools in retrofit, I've re retrofit a lot of schools, you know, and I know that there's 30 million dollars I read in the newspaper that we have no but out of the taxpayers, not out of the taxpayers dollars. $30 million. My suggestion is, this is my suggestion, why couldn't we take that money and divide it up between the two schools, upfit those schools, retrofit those schools to be up to par, instead of building a school and having all our students out of disarray, moving, leaving from where they're at, where they're comfortable, in the place that they're comfortable. I've been in a school, I've walked, I've been in a lot of schools in, in my life doing retrofit as a welder, and there's a it, to me, the school, the, the bones, the bones look, look very good in the school. I don't know. We'll have a discussion about exactly what's underneath the ceiling and what's underneath the floor and what's in the walls, which is the, which is the big part of the school, and I understand that. There's people that I've talked to all over the state as far as Washington, D.C., that's concerned about Rosenwald Elementary School. Society Hill is the oldest, one of the oldest towns in, in South Carolina. It is on the great P.D., we have a lot going on. We are going to have a lot going on there. That could be a, a, a beautiful town, a wonderful town. It's on the great PD. It was the interstate 
in the 18th century, in, in the early 18, 1900s. It was the interstate of, of South Carolina. <clears throat> it was the interstate. I want to bring me, the council, and the people of Society Hill want to bring our town back. We want to bring it back to a place that it used to be, a place where family is. There's a, as I campaign through the street society here, there's a lot, of, a lot of houses that's empty, a lot of family houses that, that's empty. And I'm, I, I plan to reach out to those, those, those people. Grandma's gone. The, the, the grandma may be gone, but there's the, the daughters and the, and the grandkids and the sons to fill those places, to come back to the town. And if we had some, it, it, our school is, the, the, our elementary school is the only thing we got. We don't need another empty building. It, people talk about how when St. John's, the, the high school left, it was devastating. I spoke to a gentleman that was in the high school, and, and he, was, he was devastated by when the school left. And I just can't imagine us doing this to our poor little town of society here. I beg of you, I, I plead with you to please have, have an understanding of maybe we can do this. Maybe we can upfit these schools and have them up to par. Another thing, 11 to 1 is a ratio of the students in our school. I'm a teacher. I am a welding educator, AWS certified welding educator. I taught at Northeast Technical College. So I know about students in the classroom, and I know when there's 20 students, and I know when there's 10 students, and I know the difference in how I can, as a teacher, as an educator, perform my duties to educate that student. I can educate 10 students easier than I can 20 students. And they get a lot more out of it. And everybody knows that. Okay? We, we have been to those schools where the, it, back in the old days when it was 10 or 15 in the class. And now there's 30, 25 or 30. So the, the education, in my opinion, my suggestion is, is better in an 11 than a 20 number classroom, student classroom. Mr. That's it. My time's up. One minute. Got some notes on the back. <clears throat> you know who said you, you can't really put a cost on education? We know that. You can't, we, we cannot put a cost on the education. Okay, we have that money, and I, I know it's gonna be it's gonna be used to the good. I talked to um, Senator Malloy this afternoon too, and just just in brief, just about you know the, the what is my plans? You know, he questioned me, what, what are you planning to do? What, what, what is my plans for this school? You know, and, and I want to see it stay in Society Hill. Because I, I just got in here, guys. I'm a new guy, all right? I'm a, I'm a new guy, and I, I got energy, and I got building experience, and, and I got, um, I can talk to people to get them motivated. And we, we have things going on right now. And if we can just keep those things going, if you take our school from us, if you take our school from us. Please don't take our school from us. We need our we need our school. We need our school to make our town grow, to make it better, and we'll make it happen if you give us that chance. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Okay, moving on to uh, consent items. Education and admissions. I have a motion for that. I'll second. I'll second. Any discussion on that. All in favor of approving the adult education and admissions? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Minutes for the regular uh, February 14th, 2022 regular meeting. We approve. A minute. Second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion? Uh, have it. The next regular Garden County Education uh, Work Session is scheduled for Monday, March 28, 2022 at 6 p.m. in the Board Training Room here at the District Administration Office. The next regular meeting of the Garden County Board of Education is scheduled for April 11, 2022 at 6 p.m. in the Board Training Room here at the Administration Office in Garland. Budget reports and federal fund reports. Anything, Ms. Douglas? Mm -hmm. Any questions on that, anyone?
capital projects update. Dr. Newman, Mr. Carr. <laughs> Chairman Jeffers, members of the board, members of our audience, which it's great to see people again. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for caring uh, about our kids. We appreciate that. Um, and of course, we have our Facebook. That's a new thing in the past two years, our Facebook Live audience, too. So um, I'm going to go through a few details about some of the conversations that we've had. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the numbers that are involved, talk a little bit about some of the different environments that our students are currently in. Um, in, in our older schools and in our newer schools. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the cost for renovations uh, and what it's going to cost to potentially uh, renovate. In this particular situation, we, we started with the St. John's building, uh, but there's certainly another exercise to work through uh, if that was uh, in, you know, another indicator for Rosenwald as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about the money uh, the board has asked where, you know, do we have money to do this and where does the money come from? Um, and so if, if you'll just bear with me, I'm, I'm just going to kind of move around a little bit through some things. Uh, but again, board members, if you have any questions while I'm working through this, pause me, stop me. Uh, I, I have uh, Joel Carter for Jumper Carter Cease that's here with us as well. Um, they were the uh, entity that was hired back in 2012 to do the original facility study in the Arlington <coughs> County School District. Um, and so a, a neutral entity was hired to look at all of our facilities, all of our schools across Darlington County Schools, um, and give us recommendations about how we can make them better environments for our children. And so uh, again, that, that started in 2012. We updated it in 2019. Um, actually, we had a lot of conversations in 2019, and then in spring of 2020, everything ground to a halt from what we were dealing with um, with the pandemic. So, again, we've picked back up the conversations, but just uh, you know, talking through some of the different pieces here. So, if we talk about what our current schools look like versus a new school, we built that because of that building assessment survey that was done in 2012, we actually combined six buildings into three buildings that were completed in 2020. So um, all three of our attendance areas in Hartsville, Darlington, and Lamar received new elementary schools, and they were a combination of two buildings that were in those communities that combined. Um, and so Part of the recommendations that were in that 2012 have already taken place. Um, and so just talking a little bit through this. So St. John's Elementary, this is a uh, 5K classroom um, in St. John's. Um, and you know the, the, the biggest thing right off the bat that I can talk to you about is that our older facilities and those that were built in the 50s, um, they have approximately 650 square feet for a classroom. Our new classrooms in our new elementary schools have 900 square feet. So it's almost a third more space uh, in, for the ability of children to be in there, uh, the ability for space, for airflow, for light. So this is a new classroom at our JL Kane Elementary School. And you can see the difference. There's higher ceilings. There's significant lighting. There's technology that's on the wall that's over the whiteboard. Um, there is cabinetry. Um, there is all of the wiring and technology that's in place. We go to the computer lab um, in St. John's. And again, if you'll notice the poles that are in the middle, this is something that, that schools retrofitted in order to put technology in. If you notice how close the, the, first of all, the tables and desks are with the, with the computers, but um, it, it's out of necessity because of the internet cabling and the power constraints that are in this building. I'm going to come back to what a lab looks like in, in J.L. Kane in just a minute. It, it'll show up in a different manner. Um, again, another classroom. This is, uh, I believe, a fourth grade class um, at St. John's. Again, if you notice the narrowness of the room, I will say this, our people have done a phenomenal job of keeping our buildings up. Uh, both 
we're talking about St. John's and Rosenwald. They have done an incredible job of keeping those facilities clean and presentable. So this is by no means any bearing on the job that those folks have done to maintain our buildings. Uh, oh, let me go back real quick. One thing I want you to, be, uh, to, to take notice of, this is from the front of the classroom. And so the, the, we're in the doorway taking this picture. So if you notice the depth of, of what we're, the classroom that we're dealing with here. At JL Kane, you, here's a 5K classroom in comparison to what we had um, at St. John's. And if you notice the spacing, the amount of students that are in there, um, how close the tables are, or really how separated they are, truthfully. Um, the teacher's arm, you can see, we're standing at the door. To the left, there's a whole other area of this classroom. Again, more space, more lighting. This is um, one of our classroom doors at St. John's Elementary. And when we're, we're talking about safety and security, and we're talking about uh, if there's ever emergencies and what we have to do to protect our children, um, there are these double doors that are in many parts of the building with this wide, you know, footprint that they have as well. Um, this is a door at our new schools and so if you notice the push bar that's there, you also notice the, the lock that's on there, that's on the inside of the classroom. So if there's a lockdown or if there's an emergency, teachers, uh, folks are able to lock in instead of having to go outside of their door and lock their door. Um, and again, the, the push bar versus just the regular handles that, that unfortunately we have to replace a lot of. This is the cafeteria at St. John's, the current one. Again, they've done a great job. The cafeteria staff and custodians were there when we were walking through. Um, I will point out here, there's a big stack of bags here. These are the bags that they're using for breakfast early in the mornings for the students. Um, there's just no place to put them. And, and so it's not that they're bad housekeepers. They just there's just no place to put things like that um, in, in the you know with the constraints of the space. You notice the poles that are in the middle as well. Um, this actually back behind this wall is where the serving line is. So back behind these solid doors is where our cafeteria folks are that are serving the kids. And so the students have to walk behind this wall and then come out. This is a new cafeteria at J.L. Kane Elementary School. And again, you can see that this is the serving area back here that is glass that everybody can see in, that our cafeteria folks can see out and see the children that they're serving. Um, you'll notice the types of space that's here with the tables, um, a lot more room, a lot more space for students. Uh, you look at the ceilings, you look at the, the, the windows that are above and at ground level, um, the flat panels that are available <clears throat> for messaging as well as just during lunchtime. Um, so, again, just the differences when we talk about what's going on. This is our cafeteria behind the, the solid block that I was talking about. These are windows actually back here. Uh, but, it, you know, the biggest thing is the hood is within about four feet, six feet right here. This is where our folks are working under. We replaced this hood uh, somewhat recently, but still we are constrained by the actual size that we're dealing with. This is the new cafeteria um, at JL Kane. Again, a much larger hood space. These are stackable and movable equipment that they can uh, prepare different types of food, and instead of being um, actually mounted to the floor, they're able to move these uh, different pieces around. Um, again, the tables, lots of room to be able to use for cutting and sorting. Um, and again, just the size that the folks have to be able to move around. Uh, this is a hallway at St. John's. Um, and if you'll just, you know, the key thing is that we've got electrical panels that are in the student hallways here. Again, the, the, well maintained, but nevertheless, power that's on the access of, of where kids walk through at all times. 
Uh, again, another power, this is what we're having to do in order to charge iPads in this room. Uh, you notice that the, the blocks are on this side of the strip here. This is not by any stretch an ideal situation for electrical and some of the constraints that we have. A lot of folks, they, they say, well, how do you retrofit older buildings? Um, and this is an example of where some has been done, but it's basically drilling large holes through very thick concrete uh, in order to have the conduit on the outside of the walls here. That's, this is an example of, of, of the fire protection system that's in, but again, this was installed after the fact. There's a couple um, electrical conduits up this way as well. This is one of our hallways at St. John's. Um, again, um, I, I will point out that this is approximately six and a half feet wide here uh, for this space for students. Um, we have a big problem with ADA compliance, uh, wheelchair access. Um, all of these things that affect students with disabilities um, are an issue with our older buildings. This is a hallway at JL Kane. Um, it is 10 to 12 feet wide, uh, so a lot more space. Uh, and one of the big things in the newer buildings is there are one level, so you see everything when you walk down a hallway. Um, and so the, the view from a safety and security standpoint is that you can see all the way down, but again, there's more room for ADA compliance. If you'll notice these doors, this is where the electrical is in this building. It's behind actual wooden doors that are locked. Another hallway um, at St. John's. And, and Again, credit to our teachers and credit to our principals and our school staff. This is their small group area out in their hallway. And so, you know, when, when we try, we're, we're really big right now into having groups of four and five students work with an adult at a time to try to, you know, we're trying to catch our students up from COVID. And so this is a big part of it is small group instruction. And so you can see, you know, again, you, you've got a fire uh, instrument on the outside of the wall here, uh, as far as a fire extinguisher, um, and, and the space here. And then, of course, you see it narrows down even more when we get past here. So is that where our interventionists are meeting with the kids? Like yes. Yeah, so, so, you know, we have a lot of uh, reading interventionists, but we also have a lot of part-time uh, teaching assistants that are also helping us with that small group instruction and one-on-one -on -one and reading to students. This is what's taking place at Kane. This is that space. So they've got tables, they've got small chairs that are suited for children. You've got this very wide space. There are uh, several of these through every hallway at Kane where it widens out to have this collaborative space for adults to work with children. I mentioned that I was putting a pause on the computer labs because this is actually the computer labs at JL Kane. They are all mobile. So there's not a need to have wired computers attached to poles like what we used to do. Uh, with everything, with, with fully functional technology uh, and high speed internet available uh, with fiber, um, this is the way we work with computer labs now. So they get rolled into the different rooms as they sign them out and need to use them. Again, note that you're looking through and you see here's some students back over here. So again, you have full views. Notice the colors and the light um, that they have. Higher ceilings, more space. This is the media center. Uh, at St. John's, which is on one of the lower floors, and, and this is actually a ramp here that kind of, with a metal bar here that, that slopes down. Um, but again, um, you, you can tell just by the lighting um, how low the ceilings are here. Um,
again, they've done a great job of taking care of what's there. But again, poles in the middle. Um, and this is the media center at J.L. Kane. Um, and again, you notice the high ceilings. You notice this big window that looks out onto the playground area that's outside of there, the spacing, um, just the colors in the carpet, the, the brightness. Um, it's just a lot more inviting for children. <coughs> this is our nurse's office that we have <coughs> at Kane right now. I need to make sure and point out this is actually a classroom. So you said at Kane, but you mean at St. John's. I'm sorry, at St. John's, yes. Uh, so this is at St. John's, um, and this is our nurse's office, which is actually a classroom, because there's not a nurse's office. Um, and so they've had to convert a classroom. Um, this is the a, a teacher's desk that, again, stayed behind. Um, and, again, the, the area where students um, are met with the nurse. This is the nurse's office at J.L. Kane, and this is just half of it. Um, again, you've got a sink, you've got cabinetry, you've got curtains with a rail that can pull to cover. Um, this is the other side where you have, this is the nurse's office here. So remember we saw a desk sitting out in the middle of the room at St. John's. This is actually a locked door that the nurse is able to be behind with all of her files, telephone, any of those types of things. And here's a bathroom <coughs> as well in the nurse's office, which again, very important to have available. This is our playground. Beautiful sky. And um, you can tell we took this picture recently because flowers are blooming on the the trees, the dogwoods out there. Um, but I do want to point out a couple things. Um, there is, this is all sand. Okay, so this is sand from, from here all the way back. Um, this is one area of play, and this is another smaller area here. Um, this is the front of the whole school out here. Um, and then, of course, back over here is the road um, and, and the neighborhood that's right in front of the road. So um, <coughs> students have to walk across the fire lane in order to get over to this area. And this is the playground area at J.L. Kane. Um, again, if you'll notice, there's a set, set, and then set, and then these are basketball courts back over here for the students. Full basketball court with two goals. You'll notice the play surface. This is the rubberized material um, that is made to last a very long time and be cushioned as far as the students being able to play and fall and all that kind of fun stuff on it. Um, and then you also notice the fencing here. Uh, for example, this is one of the younger groups area, play area, and so there's fencing around it to keep our younger children there. Um, also on the back side there's full fencing and this big point to make out, this is on the back side of the school. So you don't see any of this from riding by the front of the school. This is a bathroom at St. John's Elementary School. Um, this is a girls bathroom actually. Um, and I want to point out a couple things. There's a sign right here that says maximum four occupants right here. This is one of two sinks that's, that's in there right now. Um, and so this is a maximum of four. There's actually three stalls that are back in here. And then I'm circling this sign right here because that sign says high voltage. And that is a high voltage electrical panel in the girls' bathroom in this particular location. Again, another bathroom. Um, one thing that's unique about St. John's is their bathrooms are on the corners of their hallways. If you don't visit there often, you think you're walking down a stair and you walk into a bathroom. Uh, and so it is, it is 
quite confusing at times. Again, the old leaded glass that's here um, and the older plumbing that's there as well. This is a bathroom at Jail Kane. This is a, a boys' bathroom that's there. Um, notice the tiling that's down here. Notice the tiling that's up here. The three sinks with mirrors, lighting, higher ceilings, much more light in here. Uh, of course, the air dryer um, and the stalls. Is the occupancy for the restrooms greater at Jail Kane? It is. Okay. It is. And you notice the three sinks that were sitting there. Yep. Versus There's the typically five stalls that are in there as well. And then the space just in general. Okay. Uh, the the occupancy of four has to do with certainly fire code, but also mm -hmm. just how small cramped the quarters are. Um, outdoor cooler. This is, Jail Kane doesn't have an outdoor cooler but St. John's had to put an outdoor cooler in because there's no space inside to do this. Now, one of the big issues with this is when it's 110 degrees outside in the summer, um, this is incredibly impacted. So trying to keep food cool in summer months and in early fall months when we start back, because again, we're going to be starting back, our students start back August 1st this year. So we'll be during the August dog days, as they say. Um, and so this this is a this is this is an issue. Um, one of the unique things about St. John's is they they have a an indoor basketball facility. But the reality is they have this because this is the old high school gym. They don't build elementary schools with basketball gyms. And so. Yes, this is, you know, it's neat, it's got the bleachers, this is a new floor, it's had, this had to be replaced because of water issues. We are constantly battling water issues in this old gymnasium, as well as um, roofing issues, as well as uh, alarm issues because the electrical is um, unstable. Uh, so we have lots of false alarms that we get calls at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning over. Um, it's been years. Uh, I know it's been four years since I've been here, but but again, that is unique uh, to have that large. But but again, here's your HVAC in there. Is this piece here? And this piece. This is heat and HVAC. Is that the right size for that space, still? Is it heat and cool that? Yeah. Uh, the entire building. Cooling. I don't no, I don't. I think it's just heat. It's just heat. It's not a heat pump. It's just gas heat. Gas heat. Hey, um, the, I did a walkthrough just prior to Christmas break, and that was one of the biggest concerns um, in St. John's was the gym, how they have such trouble keeping it cool. Yeah. Um, but they've actually got giant fans they bring in, blow air in from the doorway. Yep. They use it for PE. Is so they, use said, it, they use oh, it every day. Yeah. Yep. yeah, that's that's their space for, for PE. Um, and I said HVAC is heat. Those are two heaters there. We don't have cooling in there. It's the fans. It's the large fans that we talked about. Um, this is the multi-purpose room at JL Kane. Um, again, this is you know, the stage up here. Uh, so you, we had, if y'all remember, we had our back to school convocation in this building two years ago when, when the school first opened up we had lined rows of chairs here so you can use this space for events after school you can also have portable basketball goals in here and of course here is your HVAC this is heating and cooling up top in this space um, and then goes along down along the center as well storage at St. John's again they're doing what they have to uh, they're taking care of the kids the best that they can given the circumstances. Um, but you know, if you notice, there's a lamp right here in the corner that somebody's using this space. Um, and this is the storage that we have in our new schools. Um, there are there are storage rooms on every hallway, multiple storage rooms. 
they all have shelving that's in them, but most, but they also have lighting and higher ceilings and space and places where tables can be utilized. Here's another table back here. Um, so small groups, again, it's not just storage. It's every space is being utilized uh, for interacting with children. This is the one elevator that we have at St. John's Elementary School. I, I've, I've made this comment multiple times. I, I, I said there were four stories. There's not four stories, but there's at least three and a half when you consider what's underneath the auditorium. So you've got three levels of classrooms, but then you also have an auditorium that has an area underneath it as well. There's only one elevator. There's there's two, three, there's essentially four buildings on that campus and there's one elevator. And in three of those four buildings have multiple flights of stairs. They are more than one story. Um, so this just happens to be in the main building. Um, and we rode on this and it scared me. So I'm just saying that our kids have adapted to this and our kids have gotten used to this but all you have to do is look at the paneling in here to figure out when this was probably put in. We have multiple wheelchair students that are at St. John's and they can only use the one elevator that's at the far end of the main building on the left hand side in order to access the campus. This is a conference room at JL Kane. Uh, so again, space for people, space for our employees, space for our educators, space for our parents and community members. So again, they um, are able to meet. Um, you've actually got, again, whiteboard space here. Um, there are projectors available. Um, this is a comfortable environment for folks if we have to sit down and meet with parents. There are several of these conference rooms. There's one in the guidance suite and there's one over in the administrative suite. Uh, and again, it's places, these are actually two teachers that are working during their planning period that are talking through some of the data pieces. You can do your professional learning community groups, which are groups of teachers that meet. So they don't have to just meet in their classrooms. They can actually come in a comfortable space feel recognized professionally that way so okay so we'll talk a little bit about attendance numbers and transportation numbers here so there's a lot of dots up here and I, I don't expect everybody to be able to focus on every one of these dots so I'm going to point a few things out here currently St. John's has approximately 530 students that, that attend. And if you'll, this is where St. John's is located, right here in this circle. Um, um, okay? So th this is actually where the school is. 70% um, of the students that attend St. John's live farther than a mile away from the school. So they, they live a mile or farther out from the actual physical location, 70% of the students. So, so that's all these folks up over here. Okay. When we talk about bus riders, this is the locations of all of our bus riders. Again, this is where the school is right here. And the farther out you get, this is all the bus riders that are riding buses down into Darlington. What's for sale here? What, what's that top cluster? Where is that? Well, this is Floyd, so this is probably close to Tony Thomas? Bill. Doesville. Yeah. Doesville up here. That's sad. I lived here my whole life. I couldn't hear where Floyd is. Yeah. It's got it's in the same uh, So, you know, again. So that's Dusville out there. Dusville students go to St. John's. Yep. 
So they're traveling all the way down in the dark. And that's mechanical. Well, so just like this group out here is traveling swim. all the way that's down. Not, not there. Okay. Yep. Oh, mechanics will be out there. Um, Rosenwald, again, um, they've done a great job of upkeep with what's in front of them. Um, there were some renovations that were done in 2006 at this building, but again, the primary building was built in 1956. This is not the original Rosenwald School. This is the current location of Rosenwald Elementary. The original Rosenwald School was over where the high school was and moved when they built when they put the high school there they built the elementary school back in 1956 um, and so this school ha has been maintaining since then um, I'll point out this is the, the over to this side is the street that drives by Church Street um, this is supposed to be the main entrance but it is not because it is not securable with the airlock types of systems that we have in our newer buildings. Um, you actually have to walk back this way and walk in an iron gate and then go back into the school this way to get into the school. This is some of our awesome students that are there. Um, this is in the cafeteria. And again, beautiful murals that we have in the cafeteria. But if you'll notice, how narrow this space is, um, how low the ceilings are. Um, again, this is the serving line all the way back here. Okay. What's the enrollment at Rosenwald? Current enrollment as of today is 116 students, and that is grades K4, 4K through 8th grade. 4K through 8th grade. 118 students. Um, let me give you a little bit of perspective on that. In 2008, there were 210 students attending this school. 2008. In 2012, I think a lot of our folks in Society Hill knew what happened then. Um, and our enrollment dropped drastically when the plant that was up in that area went out significant loss for the town and the community and the people um, and so it dropped down to approximately 140 students at that time it uh, bounced back and forth and then again as of today we are sitting with 116 students 4k through 8th grade is it is there a consistent Decline year every year, or are there some years at that price? Um, about four years ago, no, six years ago, uh, it went from 139 to 146, approximately five, six years ago, and then it immediately dropped. So, and it's been declining every year since I've been here. This is my fourth year, it has declined every single year. Do we know how many of our students? Our middle school students who live in the in the um, Saudi Hill area already go to Darlington Middle School. I don't have that information. But we do have students who middle school students who live in the Saudi Hill area they that already Darlington. attend Darlington Middle, middle School because they have that choice, correct? Yes, that is correct. Is that for magnet or just the school choice? School choice. School choice. And just to pr put perspective on that question, so. There's 116 kids currently in the building. 27 of them are middle school students. Okay? So 27. 27 kids between 6th and 8th grade? Yes. How does that work? I mean, I've been going very, over my head. I mean, very difficult. How? So 8 or 9 kids a class? Less than that. But, how, but I mean, how do they have enough teachers to teach all the different subjects that? Well, yeah, middle school. And you have no choice but to employ because middle school has certain requirements, you know, you need certifications. And so you, you literally have super, super small classes. Um, 
it's not uncommon to have six or eight kids in the class in the elementary grades as well. Um, they have any um, honors or advanced classes no. in the middle school? No. Can't. You, know, you don't have you don't have personnel to do that. Um, you know, they uh, Rosenwall has a, a basketball team, girls and boys basketball team, uh, for the 27 students. But that's that's it as far as sports go. Um, if they want to play football, can they go to Darlington? Darlington Middle School. Yeah, Darlington Middle School. Yeah. So they can come over to Darlington for sports. Yeah, there's not a sports that's currently there. Okay. They do have so that choice. They could, but they could. But but again, think about this now. Darlington Middle School has, I'm gonna say, a thousand kids, somewhere <coughs> between a thousand and eleven hundred kids, and they have a boys and girls basketball team. They have a thousand students to choose from, or at least seventh and eighth graders. They've got 750 kids to choose from. Rosenwald has 27 kids to choose from for the same team. They're not really the same and team. That's not and girls, they do boys. well. Girls and boys. That's girls and boys, yeah. right? That's that's for both. Yeah. But actually, they do well. I mean, I, I I will give I will give them credit. They do well. So what you're saying, you've got six to eight kids being taught by one teacher there, and you go to Darlington, you've got 25 to 27 students being taught. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And typical middle school class, by the way, you know, what people say, well, what, what's, a, what's a normal class size? Mm -hmm. I mean, let's, in middle school, 25 students is a very manageable, normal class size. We shoot for 25 students in our middle schools, okay? Now, it's different for you know, earlier grades. You can you can have smaller, and, and we desire, like we try to get 20 students per class right now in our elementary grades, the majority of our elementary grades. But in middle school and high school, you know, typical class load is, you know, 24, 25, 28 so students. So are there multiple levels of curriculum for, I mean, so there's not any, there's not any honors or advanced classes. But then is everything else taught on the same level? Again, you've got sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, so they are taught their standards, right? Their curriculum. Uh -huh. So so they are definitely taught what they need right. for their particular grade level. Just not in advance. But, is, right. but my question is and, and no electives. If you primarily. have a math teacher, the math teacher has to be able to teach sixth grade, seventh grade, yes. and eighth grade. Math, yes. As opposed to Parsonal Middle School and Darlington Middle School, where it's you have an eighth one. grade math teacher. Correct. So, so the teacher is teaching one level. Right. Okay. So then, does that mean that there, for the rest of the grade levels, there's just one classroom per grade level, right? That's correct. Okay. So, so if you if you do the math on that, right? We just said that there's 27 middle school students. There's 116. So that's 89 students for seven teachers. And um, special needs as well. Limited special needs. But. All right. Um, again, we talked about the cafeteria, uh, another angle from that. Um, and I would point out the, in the HVAC system, is throughout this whole area. Um, and by the way, this can be combined with that multi-purpose room, right? So there, there's a, a retractable wall over right over here. You remember you saw the multi-purpose room with the stage and everything? <clears throat> so that can be retracted and you've got the whole area from front to back. So you, you can do full evening events with parents um, and awards and all those types of things. It's a hallway at, at Rosenwald. Um, again, awesome murals. Awesome murals. Uh, great. I mean, I think that's a great mural there on the wall. <laughs> Carolina Bay. Uh, but it, I, I don't have to point out to you how narrow this hallway is in, in comparison to, to what we saw. Now, okay, so I want to ask that. So, ADA compliance. Mm -hmm. What's the minimum? Like a new school, what's the minimum 
we have the hallway, the to the ADA compliant. OSF requires eight feet. However, six feet does meet ADA. That's the minimum. Okay. But anything new, you could not do. Right. So any so modified renovation. renovation, you could, you could, you would have to come in compliance. Correct. With OSF. They, they, they could grandfather this in. So the, the arts. You already said you you don't have band. You don't have electric, right? No. You don't have band. If I was looking at that lady up with that card, I might think it's art on the card. Because I don't know that you have a room for the art. For the visual art, to right. rephrase that. Correct. You know, and, and some of our middle schools have dance that's available. Uh, some of our middle schools have chorus, um, obviously band, um, foreign language classes. Does Reginald have a computer Business. Lab for middle school? They, they have some. Oh, okay. There's no way out for well, because I was saying, I mean, like, the Thorne Middle School has an elective, like, computer right. elective classes, so I don't have that. Yeah. Again, just talk about the hallways and the spaces that are available in order to accommodate children. Again, the attendance and transportation for Rosenwald area. This is the school here, and this is the students that attended here. So how far out are some of those furthest points? Yeah, like Antioch. Yeah, that's Birdtown. Yeah. You know that, right? Yeah, but I don't, I can't, I mean, like, how far is that? Uh, Jetport's probably, what, seven miles? Seven miles from the school? Yeah. And so these are further out than the Jetport? Correct. Jetport. Look at bus riders. Um, again, uh, not as many dots, uh, but here's the school, and here's your bus riders. They're traveling into society. Look at you. How many are all of the students bus riders? Do we no, have let, any me, let, me, let me make sure I get this number right. There's 77 bus riders out of 116 students. So that the others are either car riders or walkers. Correct. Do we have any walkers? Don't yeah, know. Uh, I, I would suspect there's, I mean, it's walking distance for some of the particular houses. I'd have to check to see if we've actually got somebody walking to school right now. But I would suspect because there are residential homes in the vicinity. All right, um, so that's just kind of a, a travel through the current schools uh, that we have our older schools, our older buildings versus our newer buildings and the uh, what's available to our students and what's available to our employees uh, that are in those environments. Um, and then we talked a little bit about um, enrollment um, and bus riders transportation um, and so now uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a, a, a what-if scenario so what if we looked at a renovation cost for st. John's Elementary to take care of all the needs that are there so Mr. Carter yes Mr. Want, Chair members of the board you want this or you want me to click for you uh, you can, I, well, either way I can click. I'll let you hand through. All right. Um, so some of, of um, <clears throat> what we're looking at, you know, we have basically three buildings, or uh, well, four buildings, A, B, C, and D. Uh, they, uh, uh, we'll look at the, the original building first, which is the B building. 
Uh, you know, if we look at a code analysis on this, it was built roughly around 1902. Uh, it houses pre-K through second grade. It's wood frame, brick veneer building. Uh, we do have some uh, one addition, or the, the stairwells on the ends are brick and uh, mortar. It's three stories. We have on the first level, we have approximately uh, 20,400 square feet. And then uh, on the two uh, uh, upper levels, uh, what we would refer to as the main level, actually, and the upper level, the third level, right at 16,800 square feet. The building is a, when we talk about buildings, it's, this is a type five uh, unprotected, unsprinkled building. And what that means is just built out of wood construction. The major structure is wood. The occupancy is type E. Now, for this particular building, according to the current code, which is 2018 IBC, the uh, maximum stories would be one story. Now, you could go to two stories if it is sprinkled. However, we have one other little caveat, and that would be that the, um, you know, the, the, the maximum area is 9,500 square feet. And if sprinkled, that could increase to 2,500, uh, excuse me, 28,500 square feet. Um, Again, other, other limitations there, but the facility is currently grandfathered in. It's being used as a school. Uh, you do have fire marshals that come by periodically, and it, and it is safe to use. Um, in, in the building A, which is its sister building that was built in 1912, houses fourth and fifth graders. Same, same construction, three stories, um, a little bit less square footage. Um, the, uh, again, maximum stories is one in this type of building unless it's sprinkled. Uh, maximum area is 9,500 square feet. And, uh, of course, that can go up. And, again, this building is also grandfathered in. You're saying, okay, when well, you're saying maximum level, you're saying, like, if we build it new? Yes, if you build this if you, new. If you built new or if you went in to renovate it? If you built new. Okay. Uh, now, to go in and renovate, um, we're going to... They will allow us some leniency from OSF, and I'll get into that a little, okay. in a little bit. But, um, but we still are, 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 the big thing is we're grandfathered in. It's still being utilized as a school. But a lot more renovations are going to, they're going to make us do a lot more renovations to this because of that third level. Again, the building is not compliant. By new code, we couldn't build it. We could not go three stories um, uh, with this building. Um, Mr. Carter, one, one caveat too, I had mentioned there was one elevator that was in the main building. Correct. There's another elevator in this secondary building, I believe, where the fourth and fifth grade are. Okay, all right. Um, the, um, again, the, the, um, in building C, which is, houses the, the cafeteria, and then also the, the um, third grade upstairs. I, I, I tagged this as 1959, it could be 57, it could be 61, but I didn't have good information on it, but roughly around 19, late 50s, um, has this cafeteria on level one, and then also the third grade on level two. This is load-bearing masonry, uh, steel bar joists, a good, you know, a, a decent building, given the age. It's two stories, uh, approximately 10,300 square feet on the first level, because you've got the, the cafeteria, I'm sorry, the kitchen area, that's part of that. And on the second level, roughly 7,800 uh, square feet. This building, according to the court, current code, is a type 2 unprotected, unsprinkled building, type E occupancy. Maximum storage for this type of building is 2. Maximum area is 14,500 square feet, but if sprinkled, we could increase that 43,500 square feet. And again, this facility is currently grandfathered in also. Um, again, in, uh, in, in we're getting into renovations momentarily, but the um, the building is, is, you know, a much safer building than the, the wood buildings. We'll just put it that way. Um, for building B, you know, required renovations on the exterior. Of course, we've got to think about storm drainage, demolition. We've got uh, renovations to meet ADA sidewalks, etc. Um, we have fire lane access. Now, what that means is that the fire department trucks have to have access pretty much on all sides of these buildings. So we would have to go back in and develop the 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 current um, um, the drive housing the um, services, for food service, etc. We would have to go back in and develop that drive a little bit more to give access back to the rear. Uh, one thing that we would also need to do is waterproof substrate walls. The building envelope 
when we talk, talk about doing renovations, the first thing we want to do is protect the envelope. That means the exterior of the building. That's your roof, your exterior walls, your windows, your doors. We don't want water coming in. We put a fresh coat of paint on the wall. We have water coming in, pushing that paint off. We don't want that. So masonry tuck pointing is part of that process. And that tuck pointing, they would go and come in, and it's very labor intensive, uh, cut the joints out of the mortar. And these old buildings like this, the, the mortar was um, really more of a lime sand type of mortar and, and was not the, the, the cement sand that we use today. So today it's, it, our, our, our joints um, are more waterproof than these were, certainly a lot more waterproof than these were, were uh, in the town. Um, so that's, that covers our, 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 you know, our building envelope, envelope on, the, on the interior. You know, we, we will probably encounter some hazardous materials. I, I know that the district has done a very good job of removing asbestos, but as we get into renovations, we don't know what's behind the wall. We don't know about mold and mildew uh, remediation, which may be required. Demolition would be required. We're going to have to relocate some walls. We, I've got on here elevator shafts, and actually that's not true. It's a new elevator that was supposed to be part of this. Um, we also, the big thing that we're going to have to do is fire protect walls and ceilings. We're going to have to go back in and put in new doors. Current doors are not, door frames are not rated, and we would also need to have rated doors uh, with, as a part of that. Um, we would need to come back in and make the building ADA compliant. Now, a lot of different things are part of it is casework. Uh, that's not ADA compliant. We would also need to what's, look at what's that? What's the case so all of your, your countertops, etc. They, they do not allow for ADA accessibility to them. Uh, so we would need to look at that. Uh, we can modify possibly what is there, but in all probability, when it's all said and done, it's going to be easier to go back in and replace that rather than trying to modify that. Um, we've got, um, again, ADA toilet renovations that would be required and that would be a must. When we do these renovations, especially the ADA renovations, we're going to be eating up square footage. So we'll, we'll lose classroom space when we do that. Why is that? Um, to meet ADA, we have to have more room, more space. The current toilets are too small to get turnarounds, ADA turnarounds. When we touch those toilets, in addition to meeting ADA, we're also going to have to bring those toilet, the numbers up to match the student population. Right now, there's a deficiency in the toilets. So OSF, they they are they are what govern all this grandfathering. I mean, that's they are the body that as says it's you, okay that we are in this condition and we don't meet whatever specific codes. As and long as you use it like it is, but as soon as we start renovating, they're going to say, "No, wait a minute, you're renovating now." We're going to make you go back in. You're going to have to fix these toilets. You're going to have to meet ADA accessibility requirements. So the law doesn't say that. Oh, that is the law. That? The, that is the law. That's actually the, the um, 2018 building code, <coughs> and that's what OSF goes. Well, that's about. what I'm saying. Yeah. But like right now, we're not the the accessibility and the the the, um, the situation in that building is grandfathered in by OSF and by the law. Correct. Now, if you were to increase your student body, you may have problems and may be required to do additions and renovations. I don't know what that number is. They've got set certain benchmarks. When you hit it, then what you have. And even OSF says that? Yeah, I mean, that's International Building Code. That's, yeah, that's correct. Yes, ma'am. Some people may not know what ADA means. Okay, ADA is uh, yeah, American Disabilities Act. And what that is, is it takes care of our, our handicapped uh, people, but also our handicapped children. And they're different requirements for our children that may be in the uh, pre-K through first grade, I'm sorry, second grade. Uh, it changes at third, fourth, and fifth grade. It changes again to adult heights once we get above that fifth grade level. So those are, are, are a little bit different. And, and, and OSF has a little bit different nuances there, but it's still basically those categories. And, I, and just to that point too, OSF, you might want to explain oh, what that is. Yeah, just OSF is the, is the governing, that's a good point. OSF is the governing body for schools in South Carolina. Um, for any um, uh, government building, we have uh, Office of State Engineers, o OSE, uh, Office of State Engineers. And then for schools spe specifically, we have um, 
OSF, which is Office of School Facilities. But school facilities are different than general construction facilities, I mean, the requirements. That, that's correct. We do have um, different requirements for our K-12 schools. That are not that are not present in, like, if Jamie's building correct. Like a Carolina Bank. Correct. And part of that governs the, the size of the classrooms. Part of it governs, you know, a lot of different okay. things. Okay, which, which that brings me back to if, what you said about bringing up, the, like you said, the bathrooms, the toilet. Right, and the toilets. Mm -hmm. And you said, did I hear, was I correctly hearing you say that you would have to eat into classroom space? Yes, because we're just, we're, there, there's no way to expand. We would have to either eat into classroom space or... So, so if we eat into classroom space, then how are we going to still have enough classrooms without having to build additions attached to the building somehow? You're way ahead of my presentation. <laughs> I mean, you just said you but, said that, and yes. I'm like, but you but just answered your but, question. But you, you answered yes, you answered exactly right. I mean, I, I mean, I'm just physically yes. saying, okay, if we cut in this classroom, then you can't put you can't put that's kids a, in that classroom. Correct, right. You got to build more classrooms. Yes. And from a cost standpoint, you talk about irrigating. Currently, we're grandfathered in. If you start doing modifications, and you got to irrigate, correct? Well, well fire sprinkler, yes, sprinkler. When I say yeah. irrigate, mm -hmm. yeah, fire sprinkler. But that's correct. Which is unbelievably expensive for some reason. I can put one in the ground a lot cheaper than you can put one in a building. But yes, that's true. Now, that goes back to the system. Well, we, I, the district did a lot of uh, abatement, asbestos abatement. We didn't do asbestos abatement in St. John's. We did yeah. not. And, and that's where we, we, we feel like we will run into those hazardous materials. We didn't touch floors or anything, and, and every floor you touch has got something. <coughs> yes, ma'am. You're fine as long as you don't disturb it, correct? That's correct. I mean, it's safe right now and, for the kids. It's, it's safe because you're not disturbing it. That's, that's right. what I wanted to make. Yeah, I'm so, and, and, and we should be clear about this. Yeah. The building today is safe for students. Yes. Is it adequate for students? No. It, but, but is it safe today? Yes. But, but is it equitable compared to what our new schools are? It's not close to being equitable. So Dr. Dawson, to your point, the, the, um, that I'm aware of, I think your um, friable um, um, asbestos is out of the building. Now that doesn't mean we may not find some in a wall where they used to use old pipe joints, old insulation. When, when this building was heated by steam, then probably some of that is, we're gonna encounter some of it. However, the mastic on the floor and the and the asbestos vinyl tiles that are down there, it, it's it's not a risk. It's not friable. The the asbestos is in that mastic, and it's really no way to make that friable to be a, to be of harm to someone. However, as we renovate, we we'll want to get that out completely. One of the other issues that we dealt with was uh, with the seismic uh, about the requirements. If we have earthquakes, there's certain seismic things that we have to read. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, there is. It is debatable if we would have to go back in and do something in this building. If we would, I'll show you costs in a minute, but if we were to have to do that, you mean those, those costs. You have to do something to improve the seismic? Yeah, right now, right now they have not, it really have not required us to do that in these buildings. And uh, but if, if that was a requirement, then, then it would the, the, the numbers. I mean, it's almost a tear down. I think one of the other issues we had to deal with was parking. There's been a change. OSF is requiring different kinds of parking. Traffic parking line. at this point. Correct. Yeah. So you have to have more <coughs> parking spaces mm -hmm. uh, for OSF. That's and right. If they don't approve it, then we can't do it. Yeah. So so we we will have to go through and do a life safety site plan, uh, first of all, to make sure that we can get fire truck access, parking, uh, uh, pedestrians, etc., uh, around and out of the building uh, before we really really do a whole lot. So that's going to be one of the first things they ask. Yes, sir. Good question. Since it looks like basically we're going to have to gut this whole building for new electricals, new plumbing, the whole works, and it was built in an older style of masonry, et cetera, or whatever, and would, is it the found, founding foundation of it even to be able to survive that we kind did, of rebuild? And, and to answer that question, we did not see any signs of 
any foundation or any wall deterioration, etc. Where the building settled, any any noticeable, you know, cracks that says, hey, this is an issue. We did not see that. Not to say that the walls aren't covered enough, but usually you will see signs of that uh, in the form of cracks, either in, in concrete or in the drywall, etc. And and what we saw, I mean, is, is more normal there. So, but you're right. Uh, plumbing renovations. Uh, plumbing renovations would all all have to be, you know. The problem there is the infrastructure. You're having leaks. You're having not only not only water lines but also sewer line leaks. So all of that needs to be addressed. The mechanical system would certainly have to be replaced. The big thing there is the fresh air. Uh, we refer to it as ASHRAE uh, requirements. And we're going to have to bring in fresh air to meet the ASHRAE. When we bring fresh air into the building, we have to be careful because that air has to be dehumidified because we don't want to bring straight outside air in. Then we're adding to the humidity in the building, which creates our mold and mildew problems. Uh, electrical systems, you know, we've got, we're going to have to upgrade the switch gear. The switch gear is, is pretty much shot. Um, it, it, it's just old, it's been patched, uh, et cetera. Uh, so we've got new switch gear, fire alarm, intercom, security data, additional power outlets that we saw earlier in the classroom, and then also mechanical uh, power there. So that's your kind of your 1902 building. The 1912 building is going to be very similar. Uh, uh, you know, not to rehash everything, but pretty much everything that was in, in the 1902 building is the same there. Uh, when we go to, the, to building C, the 1959 building, of course we've got uh, general site work demolition. Uh, we've got um, uh, additions, extension of the fire lanes to get us around to the other side of that building. We've got um, um, building envelope, same, same issues there. Uh, we do have one thing, that's EVES, and what that stands for is Exterior Insulation Finish System. We had an, one time in this building, uh, there, there were a lot of windows. We had glass block windows. That was removed in, my guess is, the uh, early 80s. Could have been late 70s. Probably. 86, okay. Yep. 86. And then when that uh, renovation occurred, then they used that product um, um, of, of EFS to, to infill some of those walls. Um, interior renovations are, are very much the same that you saw below. Our ADA compliant casework, toilets, etc. Remember, the building was built in 1959. Uh, we're going to have to fire sprinkle this building. Um, even, even though we showed you earlier that it appeared to meet code, we still are going to need to fire sprinkle the building to make it meet code because we're over. One other little caveat that I did not put over there on there was any time we get over, um, and I'm going to mess this up. I think it's 12,000 square feet in an educational facility. We have to fire sprinkle it, and we would be obviously over that um, in that building. Uh, of course, we've got elevator, elevator shaft. We've got uh, the plumbing renovations, mechanical renovations, electrical upgrades. Very similar to what we talked about before. Right, like C, yep. okay, C is the cafeteria building, right? C is the cafeteria, C is the cafeteria yes. So, I mean, how do you just put an elevator shaft into, into a building? Okay, okay. All right, good question. Because this building, again, is a steel building. We've got bar joists, so we would have to go back in and modify those bar joists, put in additional steel to support that. Probably would have some columns, but in those columns, we would hide those in new walls that we would have in the elevator shaft. Um, so all of that can be done. It, 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 uh, it, it's a little more involved here than it, than it would be in the wood. The wood's a little bit easier to work with. But, um, but we don't have that much of a problem there because those shafts are already existing. But here it does, it does create um, some problems for us with that. But it can be done. It's expensive. Are we able to use all three levels after renovation? You, you, you would be, yes. Sir. All, all of them would be accessible then. And again, that's just part of the. What about the, the safety? Structure. I mean, currently, I mean, the connections between one building to the next building is an open breeze way. Correct. Would that stay? The, I mean, because that's that's the safety. I'm going to address that momentarily, but to answer <laughs> <Sorry>. that, <laughs> to answer your question, uh, yes, we've got we've got uh, those, those walks are too steep right now uh, between the buildings to meet ADA accessibility. Uh, so we would have to go back in and rework those walks. When we re rework the walks, 
we're going to be adding more uh, ramp space and also roof space. And I've got two scenarios there that we'll talk about just, just in a moment. Um, so if we look at... Come on, um, let him do his stuff. Let him do his stuff. Well, if, if we look at just, just the renovations, this is just the renovations, and these, these are our estimates. Um, we're right at $33 million for those three, three buildings, okay? Uh, we haven't addressed the gym yet, we'll get there. Uh, but $33 million, roughly that's 100,000 square feet in those three buildings that, that we've got uh, there. So you can do quick math on that as far as square foot costs. Other consideration. So I did not include money. Uh, we do have money for grading um, uh, to make the builders ADA accessible. Money is not included for placing canopies above that. The current canopy coverage, uh, Mrs. Hassler, to answer your question, is right at 5,000 square feet. Um, when we build those ramps, we're going to have to put in switchbacks to make this meet ADA accessibility. When we do that, we're estimating that we'll be right at 8,500 square feet um, of canopies, covered canopies, which are going to be in the uh, $375,000, $400,000 range. That's in, not included in that third. It's not included in that. We're going to, I'll get there in a minute. We're going to show a bigger number in a minute. So this is other items that will have to be done. Um, in addition to that, uh, and to answer your question, estimate of classroom space lost to elevators, ADA, big things, ADA toilets, is roughly one classroom per floor. And if you think about the number of floors that you have, you've got three in one building, three in another building, and two in another building. That's a total of eight floors. So it's eight classrooms that we're going to lose in some fashion. Now, we may be able to save a portion of that classroom, which could be an itinerant type area, et cetera, but we're going to lose in that neighborhood of eight classrooms. That's about 10,400 square foot addition at $300 a square foot in today's prices is going to be uh, roughly a $3.1 million addition. Um, the gym building, in, in talking, I, I did not have a lot of information on the gym building. And, and um, again, but, but it's thought that the court seating area is roughly 8,500 square feet. Uh, the toilets in that building, we would have to meet ADA toilets uh, because we don't want the students to leave that building have to go back to another building and utilize toilets. Uh, we've, we've got to make that meet. In addition to that, we would also have probably a staff toilet in there too. Um, we would need a fire sprinkler system. Um, it, it has been said that the space needs air conditioning. Hopefully it does. So rough, these are minimal numbers. And I, I, minimal numbers. I, I don't know that we can do this, but, but with the minimal dollars that I have, but interior finishes, wood floor refinishing, ADA compliant toilets, uh, HVA, this would be barred units, we would hang on the exterior of the building, and then, and then roughly electrical upgrades that are kind of minimal there. About $325 would be the minimum. Yes, sir, Mr. Governor. So that also means you're going to reduce the number of people going to be able to get into that gym because if you've got to go with the way they build gyms and fields now based on butt size, you're going to have less. You're going to have less room. Well, we're not really addressing those bleachers. I'm not even addressing the bleachers on this in this estimate. So, if you wanted to replace the bleachers, then we would have to add more money to that. But I was just trying to get by with a minimal number of dollars on this. But, but they again, really use that building for anything but PE. So, I mean, there's not a, times when there's a lot of people in that building. Daddy daughter dance, okay. stuff like that. But, but I so, hate to say what so you're going to do it, you want to do it where it can be used. Yeah. Again, a, a, as we're talking to you, so we're seeing that that number is probably going to go up. Because we're going to want, if we do those type of renovations, we're going to want to go back in and do other things. Because I really... talking about future. Yes, sir. And you already said that you're looking at 20, 30 years down the road. If you're building it for growth, then it doesn't make sense to do it and not include it. Yes, sir. And so, you know, one of the things not in here is, is, again, our exterior. I did not include anything for that building envelope, roof, walls. Um, and, then, and then, you know, one other thing that I did not include is if you look at that school, there are a lot of buildings that are attached to, for instance, the A building, which is the third, uh, fourth and fifth grade building. I, I, I don't know what type of firewalls are in there 
OSF is probably going to make us go back in there and at least do something to those walls to make them uh, 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 better or sound, more sound for firewalls and, and fire ceilings may be required also in some of those buildings. Um, and Mr. Carter, just yes. to add too, when we're talking about those extra buildings, there's also another auditorium. Correct. An abandoned auditorium on the back side yes. of the classroom <laughs> space. Correct. And so, you know, again, you've got that to deal with as well. Um, as far as what are you going to do, and that and the district doesn't own that building. I guess I hadn't really thought about that. That JC Daniel Auditorium is attached, attached to that building. How, yes. how do you do that? How do you sell off part of the building? That's the way they build it back there. How do you? Yeah. Very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, again, more items for consideration. Site security is a big issue. Uh, you know, we could improve that with perimeter fencing. Um, as far as that perimeter fencing goes, about 3,300 linear feet of fencing with associated gates for fire department access, maintenance, pedestrian gates, uh, egress gates, et cetera, will be required. Um, it, it, we're thinking that if, if you just went with, with regular old fencing, 3,300 linear feet, um, six foot chain link type fencing, uh, you're going to be around $150,000, but we think you're probably going to want to dress up the front and utilize some aluminum, nicer aluminum. It'll look like wrought iron, but it's aluminum. It's a less expensive way to do that. And so that's going to put us probably in that $225,000 range. Um, again, currently it's understood that there are four buildings being used on this campus. Um, the 1902, 1912 cafeteria building and gym building. Considering that, um, a fifth building would be needed to provide classroom spaces lost due to ADA. Ms. Hassler, I think that's where it goes to your, your question. Um, uh, so there's five buildings on the campus. It's going to be difficult to secure. You're moving students constantly back and forth. So how do you lock those doors? Do they always have to have a teacher with them to unlock doors, etc.? cetera? Um, and, and then, again, um, the four classrooms um, that we have at Rosenwald, if you chose to incorporate that, that would be another $1.3, $1.4 million. Um, uh, um, and one big thing. You're meaning we'll, four, four classrooms based on the amount of kids Student population. 89 four, students. Yeah. Okay. For, for, for that. Because, I mean, they're clearly in more than four classrooms right now. Correct. But you're just right. saying just on average. Correct. Um, and then one other, one other thing that I want you to realize is that we have, you know, five grade levels that are currently housed above or below, I should have said above or below that, the, the main entrance. So you look at the number of levels that an administrator has to think about when they're, when they're trying, if, if a child has a seizure, if, whatever it may be, how many grade levels that you've got to go and, and, and um, uh, really um, administer and, and uh, there it's, it's a lot and one other big item that I want everyone to realize that all this is what we think OSF will allow we don't know until we get down there and sit down with them so it's pending OSF approval of our logic that we've done our firm has done on this um, when we look at all of the numbers um, you know, we, we already kind of looked at those first three, but when we look at new addition uh, um, and open connectors, you know, we're looking at another three and a half million dollars. Uh, the gym renovations um, um, and site fencing, uh, right at another three hundred twenty-five thousand. And then, I'm sorry, site fencing is there. Should take that out. And then site fencing is about two hundred twenty-five thousand. Uh, one other item that I forgot to go over was um, um, the portable classrooms because I was going to ask about that. You yes, I, I did not have that in there. and So I, I, I thought I did, but I didn't. I didn't see it. I mean, anyway, you a bullet down there, but you skipped yeah, it. Yeah. But you didn't have it in the price. Okay. So, um, yeah, the portable classrooms. I mean, if you think about it, what we're going to have to do is look at the worst case scenario and let's just take that 1902 O2 building. I think it's got the most classrooms in it. I think it's 15 or 16 yeah. uh, classrooms. So we're going to need that many portables 
In addition to that, we may need a portable for um, uh, the gymnasium too to house PE classes in there while that's being renovated. But the bottom line is um, we're going to end up with, with 15 portables. Those portables, I don't know, Dr. Newman, I'm, I'm assuming that they're going to probably be around $100,000 a piece. Um, and then you, you've got to make sure that you've got water. We're going to have to put water, sewer, sewer electrical, et cetera, fire, to those. So it's a protection. lot of logistics that has to go into this before we even think about renovating these. So that's that's another another number there. So what happens if uh, if the kid is on a second or third floor and he's got to use the elevator and the power goes out? How do you get the kid down? Um, so the way that the elevators work, these are not on emergency backup or anything, but the way the elevators, if, let's say that there is a fire that occurs. The elevators are designed in the event of a fire to go down to the lowest level so that they can be utilized by fire department personnel. So a small child, now, um, Dr. Dawson, this is really no different than any other building, any, any new building that we have. We have what we refer to as an area of refuge where we would put uh, ADA type people, uh, be it they could be on crutches, they could be uh, in wheelchairs, etc. And, and in the stairwells, we typically have those uh, area of refuge big enough to house a number of those, of those uh, people slash students in our case. And then the uh, fire department will go up and physically pick those people up and remove them and bring them, take them safely out of the building. And that's the way that that works. But that's not Again, we may not have the area of refuge uh, in the stairwells, but that's the way that that would work on any of our buildings right now. So you, you still, today, that's an issue. It would still be an issue then. Correct, to your so, point. But there has been some discussion in the State Department and in the legislature that they are not supporting the building, uh, none of the schools now, they're talking about building new facilities. That because of those types of issues. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, legislature and the State Department of Education. And, and I mean... How many, how many places build two and three-story schools now? You can't build a three-story element. You're not allowed to. That's correct. So. As a matter of fact, we can't even put some amenities on the second floor. We had one site where we had uh, beautiful view where we want to put the media center on the second floor and we couldn't because we had to make it accessible to all of the pre-k first second grade students and on because, the third fourth and fifth because first and second they they have to be on first k2 had to, to be on the first floor. pre-k through second grade has to be on the first floor correct okay and the size of the classroom is different is that correct? yes ma'am and they have um, to have restrooms and those 4k 5k classes yes ma'am you are correct and and the code does not specifically require that. OSF does have a statement in there about that. The, the, the big reason that we do that, and, and, and your district is, is no different, we don't want to send a four or five year old child down to a group toilet which may be being used by fifth graders. It's just too much of an opportunity for bullying, and just all kinds of things that can go on there. Um, uh, also, a little fourth grader, they get lost. They just get lost. And so we don't want, you know, we want to contain them in the classroom and we can monitor them and watch and assist if needed rather than sending them down to a group toilet. Um, so do our current K-2 classrooms at St. John's have bathrooms in them? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, some of them do. The ones downstairs do. The special needs rooms do. But... Um, double check on the 4k I, I don't think well the 4k had to based on yes sir yes. yes so they had to have it uh, as of a few years ago basically everything on that bottom floor has got bathrooms and that's your special needs in your 4k but our first and second graders don't necessarily no. have bathrooms in, no, no, no. in the classroom no. do they have canes um, they do? yes a yes. cane yes yes at all our new schools, they do. What, what grades have it? 
of um, pre-K through second grade. Through second. At bathrooms. Yes. In their classroom. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so you, so when you were talking about the, the mobile units, I mean, besides trying to figure out where in the world we put 15 or 16 mobile units, I mean, what, so that approach you're saying would be a building by building type of approach, right? There's, it would almost to renovate. It would, it would almost be impossible to renovate one of those buildings with any students in it. It just would not be safe. So what do you do with them? So that's where we're talking about putting them in portables. So that's where we need roughly 15, 15 portables for, what kind of, for, what for the life of the renovation. Which is what? Could take probably, years for that stage. Prob probably a year for each building. So you're looking at probably so about about three portable? years. I'm sorry, Dr. Gross. Where would you put the portable? Oh, we, we just have not analyzed that, but in all probability, it's going to be there in the playground, playground area. Playground. <laughs> so where are you going to put the parking? I mean, you don't park in the playground. They, they, they have got some. He's just giving us it all parked. I don't think we've got any Yeah, we've got home. We just have not done it. And, and that cost is not included in this that's, number. That's a good point, Dr. Neiman. You know, that's the key thing that we're talking about is, we don't know what OSF is going to let us do because they, they govern this portable piece pretty tightly. Um, you know, it's got to withstand weather issues. It's got to withstand the plumbing and sewer and everything else. So, you're, you know, we, we can say it's about $100,000 to buy a portable, but as far as what a OSF is going to require, as far as walkways and access to the main building. And part of that may, may be you as you, a district. Saying, and remember, your cafeteria yeah. is in the middle of that campus. So, so you know, if your portables are right in front, that's one thing. What if, what if OSF says you have to put them over in the parking lot, over to the right side, or you know, I'm facing the building to the left side? So, you know, I, I think in fairness, the, the numbers, we, we, this number does not include adding classrooms if we added more students from another school. Doesn't include that. That's true. Or it, any growth. Are you maxed out there? Or any growth. No, not currently not but there's not a whole lot of space right now. And remember, you're doing away with space. By the ADA, by, by elevator right. shafts. So, you, so, so you're having to, <clears throat> just to keep the same amount of students in the building, you're having to add classrooms because well, of the ADA. So, but are there, are there not some renovations that can be done and others not? I mean, how's that grandfathered in so, work? So once we reach a level three renovation, there's a level one, level two, level three. What does that mean? Level one, and this is all governed by the code. Level one is um, is basically going in the painting. You know, you could you could maybe be able to replace a toilet, something like that. A level two gets a little more involved. We're going to go in and we're going to replace mechanical. We're going to do some other things. However, it still doesn't trigger a complete renovation until we reach. And, and I'm going by memory now, so don't hold me to this. It's about 50% of the building footprint, but when we reach that level three renovation, and that's when we're doing everything we're talking about doing, we're going to be there. We're going to be touching more than 50%. That's when we have to look at the entire building to bring it up to code. And so all of these renovations would be a level three, with the exception, depending on what we do with the gymnasium building D. It, it, it may or may not be, and, and it, again, that depends on, we really haven't sat down with you in a work session to talk and say, hey, Let's go over and look at these things. You know, what do you want to do for this gymnasium? And, and this doesn't include your, your fee? It does not. No. <laughs> and, and I, and, 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 it doesn't, doesn't so, include any architects. And, and so right. that, that's, that's a good, a legitimate question. So how much more do you add to that for soft costs, architect engineering fees? Um, we now have to have a, um, a building inspector that inspects our, our buildings as we're doing different work. Um, what is, what, you know, how about um, uh, possible asbestos abatement, hazardous materials, etc. It's not included in there. Um, would you go back with your existing furniture, or if you go back in and renovate, do you put new furniture in? So those costs could be probably um, the, on the on the low side would be 15 percent, probably close to 20 percent that you would add to that number right there. So another six million dollars. Yes, yeah. so, seven million dollars. So just just. Just again, if you if you talk about the portables, you talk about the extra classrooms we were talking about. Um, you're close to 40. That number's not showing right now, but sure. you're close to 40 because of the portable situation that you have to put in place if you're going to renovate 
the school. So you're close to 40, and then you're going to add 15 to 20 percent to that for the engineering fees, for the soil fees, for for all of the uh, other uh, you know professional trades that are required to make sure that this is. So minimum, done. you're at 45, pushing close to 50. And we hadn't even talked to OSF yet. We hadn't had a conversation with OSF. No, so you know. All right, and and one one, and so you. If I'm correct, you said it would probably take approximately a year per building. Correct. That's, that's excluding not doing anything with the gym, except for just the A, B, and C building. <coughs> so that's three year minimum. Right. What it, what, how, what it takes two years to construct when we, from construction to completion, Eight, not? 18 to 22 months. For new building? Mm -hmm. For new building. Now, that's. Uh, that gym wall is tied to J.C. Daniel, isn't it? No, it's the other building, not the gym. It's the... The auditorium. The C building. Yep. Or no, B building. Uh -huh. The A building. A building. A it's building. actually the A building. The 1912 it's what's tied building. your fourth and fifth but grade students. The gym is, that gym is tied to a common wall, isn't it? It is. It is. To what? Tied to a wall. Because when you're looking at the back side of it, the gym is behind... Oh, it touches it too. It is tied to a building because it. it <laughs> I can't remember. I've already been to it, so I. I, I that particular the building. The gym, the gym ain't tied anything. No. It's uh, this A building that was the old high school that's tied to the J C Daniel. Yes, yes that is the old wall That is. Correct. See, that's the main one. That's called B. That's C. The gym is over here. That's A, and it's tied to. Well, the, the, there was an issue when we got rid of the because of that building A being tied to Jason Yeah. They wouldn't let us do it. So, and, and I think it goes without saying, if anybody's done any renovations on an older home, has it ever cost what you thought it was going to be? I mean, I, you know, I, I, that, that, that's what, so, <clears throat> again, we need, to, we need to have an understanding of what is the current cost of renovations. Uh, what if it? What would it take to put that building mostly like our other new schools? And when I say mostly, you could spend forty million dollars. You still got four buildings. You still have three-story schools. You still have security concerns. Security issues with how close the road is to the front of the building. Just so, the separation of the building. I mean, security is really. I mean, it. I think it all. That's. That's my big thing, and I think it all starts there for me. And thinking about the kids traveling, and, and I, I told you, like I don't even like to talk about it out loud because it's just some of the safety concerns that are just kind of scary to me to think about. But these are our elementary schools. But but y'all, have you so have you ever been a part of a major renovation? Yeah, like so this? probably the two case studies that, that I would point to. One of them would be uh, Brooklyn Casey High School. It was built in 1930, uh, occupied in 1932. I'm not that old, but I do remember this. Um, um, high school. Yes, ma'am. Brooklyn Gates High School, and and uh, we we, we um, renovated that building in the first time in '92, and then uh, after the fire that occurred, and then um, went back in and and uh, did some other renovations, security, etc. Uh, on that building, and we've done a lot of different additions to that. But and that it was building, built in what year? Um, it was it was originally built in '32, but the um, the renovations were in '92, and then also in 2000, 2004. I'm going to say, but that that, that may not be right. But in that in that time frame, so and then we've done a di different additions to the building since that time. Um, this is a high school. Yes, ma'am. This high school. Not an elementary. Not an elementary. Not an elementary. Um, the the other the other building that, and, and that one had actually three floors, although they really do not use the lower level. Well, what would they do with all their kids while they did that? Um, Could have been mobile units. They had some mobile units. They also had another building on campus that they were able to squeeze everyone into. So then, since that time, we have torn that building down. That was the old the old. Um, so we, we um, could even think take them down to Bruns and Dargan, but still, your prices. Had, North of forty, forty-five thousand dollars. Forty-five million. Million, I mean, and so.
taking them rusty? What does it take to upfit that fit or fit them in there? And has it got the capacity to handle them? Well, there, there's a reason why there's not kids in Brunson Dark. Well, right? I, I say to upfit it for that. I mean, that's just one of you know, way. We, we built a new school because of how bad a shape Brunson Dark was in. So to be talking about trying to bring it back up for temporary for financial use. for temporary use. Well, yeah, we're talking about uh, separate two cafeterias. And, right? and one, of, time, one of the problems with bringing that building up is um, if the building has not been occupied for, I think it's 24 months, then OSF is going to come back in and make you replace fire alarm systems. So it's a lot of upgrades that have to be done there. I don't know where that number comes from, but it's kind of arbitrary, but 24 months is what they So, told but us. back to the security. So, the newer schools, I mean, what are what are some of the things that are built into newer schools so, to make them safer? So, let's talk right, off the, right out of the gate about the entranceway. We have what they call airlocks, okay? And so, when you walk into the new buildings, walk into Kane, for example, first of all, you can't walk in. It's locked. You have to press a button and say, I'm here to pick up my child. But we could do that at St. John's, right? Has, I mean, we could lock that, we could lock the door and say, no. You gotta have an airlock. You gotta build another partition on the inside to where people cannot go anywhere once they're in the one door. So I walk in that front door in my office at St. John's to the right. All those doors have to be locked and then I have to be buzzed in to be able to get into that way. And I cannot go into the building because there is the there, the there is a wall of doors that have that are that, that the opening is on the other side. So you can't have people that walk into a building and are able to walk straight in. So right out of the gate, uh, the secure entryway, what they call an airlock system, which has buzz in and buzz out. Uh, it doesn't allow if somebody came in with bad intent, they cannot get past point A. But right now that front door is locked, right? Yeah, but I'm talking two two locked doors. I know, three, but right now that we can have that front door locked where they have to buzz in. That's how it is right now at St. John's. And it is. Doing, right? But once they're in, they can run the halls. Gotcha. Whereas in an airlock, you're, you 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 buzz oh, in. So they like can go to a window at the and office, that's it. and you can approve them, and that's it. Oh, I got gotcha. you. You can't go any farther. I got gotcha. you. So you got you got two levels of security of making sure the person that's there is there for the right reasons. But what else is built into a newer school that makes it safer? Let's just take one story for a second. Let's take one story where the middle hallways and the corridors are all intertwined with each other versus what we're talking about right now with four different buildings and different levels and different angles. I mean, that's that side of the huge line of sight is, is huge. I mean, because I mean, even if you at our middle schools, you can stand in there. There is a point you can stand in, and you can see all each hallway. Each hallway. I mean, from a central, and then you know, that's a big safety. And, and so I, I could go into depth about yeah, how difficult it is, in some, but, but it's, I don't think we want to. I, I think I think it's safe to say that 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 the new buildings are designed with protecting our students in mind. It's a safety issue. And our old buildings are not. Um, it, that's just the reality. And, and so again, I, I I've used this term a couple times when we talk about equity. We have students that are in three of our brand new elementary schools, our students are having that experience right now. And then we have some of our other, other students that aren't having that experience. And, and whether it be safety and security, whether it be uh, spaces that are available to them to feel good about who they are and what but, they're doing. But now in all fairness, we got a lot of, we got other elementary schools across the district that are not having that, those kids are not having that same brand new school experience. So why why St. John's now? I mean, why, what makes this the, the focus and not, I mean, I looked at that report and there's a lot of average and poor ratings across other schools. So what makes the difference? So if you look at the 2012 report, the worst ones were the schools that we closed and built new Better. schools for. So if you look at the priorities, that when that assessment was done, there was a lot of critical needs that were on the buildings that we actually closed and built new buildings for. 
So those weren't in this because when they you were redid done. it in 2019, right. so, those came out. So, th right? so this is your next, this is your next priority, um, and, and really, it, it is, it is the right thing to do for taxpayer money, but also for children, when you have a plan that shows how long your schools last and how much money it takes to take care of them, and at some point in time you have to replace well, them. How much life we have left in these schools. So, you know, it, it, it's, that's just a great exercise for boards to do, to say, okay, th those new buildings that we built, we should have a 20-year plan of what it takes to replace the HVA systems in them, to replace camera systems, to replace the <coughs> systems in them, but at some point in time, it's not going to be cost effective to replace all the systems and you need to build again. Now, is that 50 years? Is that 60 years? That's, that's pretty much what people are designing uh, yeah. buildings to last right now. So, so, when you, so is it normal for people, school districts, to ask you to do a study like this? I mean, is this common yeah. practice? Yes, yes. That we say come in and assess our, all of our buildings in our district? Correct. And, that, and that's, that's just to give you guys a baseline of where you are. Just I mean, this, this is what they use to make decisions on yeah. what they do? Yeah. Something like this? And so, you, you know, again, to not have a plan means you're being reactive instead of proactive. So you're reacting to every emergency repair that comes up. So if I know I have a, 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 an HVAC system that's in place that's $100,000 to replace it, and I know it's supposed to last 20 years, I need to be ready to replace it at that point in time. The board needs to know those are the dollar amounts that are needed that particular year to take care of all those repairs. Um, that's being proactive and being reactive. Okay, so given all of that, where do we go from here? What's the, plan? What's, what's the next step? There was another study done before this. Where it is, I don't know, but I think I got a copy of it. A guy from Tennessee did a study before you did a study. But I think that all dates back to, Way I mean, back. my first involvement you know, was, was with the first set of, the first referendum where we did right. the middle schools and the tech and oh, the technology this was way before that. And then that, yeah. it was shortly after that that the board, y'all served on the board then, was that was when we started setting aside monies, using 8% monies to keep, right. to do, Repairs to keep no, that was this, that was this capital. This one yeah. was done prior to that, Doctor Dawson. I think that that report, um, Miss so, Doctor Stevenson. I think Stevenson. I believe was his name. No, no. Not, that, that that that's not the one that Stevenson did. This one's another guy. Okay. In Tennessee. Yeah. I'm not sure. Somebody but, out of Tennessee. I remember what's somebody a, did something. What's else. important to note, though, is that one wouldn't be relative today. Right. Unless you update it to where we are today. So you've yeah, got to constantly update it. I mean, yeah, that, that is the board right, the doing due diligence. Report, that's why we went and updated it in 2019. That was 2012, but it was one done way back. And, and that one probably was still referred to chalkboards. Right. Rather than marker boards. Right. Rather than Promethean yeah, boards, rather than smart boards, rather than uh, smart TVs. Joel, so, did you look at Roselaw any to see what you would have to do there? Um, as far as to upgrade Rosenwald, right. I, we, we, we're not tasked with that chore. Yep. So, so we, 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 started, we started with this building here because there's a lot of the same issues in this building that there are in the Rosenwald building. So when you talk about the corridors, when you talk about ADA compliance, when you talk about the safety and security, all of those same issues or in Rosenwald as well, right? So, but but the big question was, okay, how much would it take to renovate, pick a school between the two schools? Right. Obviously, this one was going to be a bigger price tag to do, so it was better to start with this. But again, many of the same issues that are in St. John's, I mean, the Rosenwald building was built in 1956. There were some renovations done in 2006, okay? But minor renovations you know the, those those the, those main buildings still have these issues so but the bigger question is is that you're going to have these types of costs associated with renovations 
But Rosenwald is a little bit different situation in, in the fact that your enrollment continues to decline. So now you're talking about putting millions of dollars into a potential renovation for a student enrollment that's declining. All right, so how, what's, what's the next steps? First of all, we are going to have public input Thank meetings, you. okay? So public input meetings, I don't have that date up here, but I'm about to give it to you because Audrey's about to give me that date. So. 22nd and 24th, I think. It's Tuesday and Thursday. And which one's Tuesday? I believe we start at St. John's and then we go to Rosenwald. Yes, St. John's. Okay. Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, St. John's, community meeting at St. John's Elementary School, 6 o'clock to 7.30, I believe. And then Rosenwall's community meeting is Thursday, next Thursday, at Rosenwall from 6 to 7.30. And that's where we can gain some public conversations. Okay, so that's, that's part of the next step. All right, let's talk a little bit about money and, and what it's looking like right now and what it's going to take. I brought this up at the last board meeting. This is a cost analysis. Um, you see St. John's total cost of running the building up top, Rosenwald Elementary Middle, the next line, and then a combined total of those two buildings together. And then you look at Bay Road, which is our new elementary school in Hartsville, and J.L. Kane, which is our new elementary in Darlington. Both of them similar size buildings that would accommodate the same amount of students that the combination St. John's Rosenwald would have. So in 18-19, that was pre-COVID, you were at almost $6 million for a combined cost. In 1920, you were at six million, and remember in the spring is when we had to deal with COVID. 2021, the reason why that number's so low, we weren't in school that much. We were out for COVID. We were, we had, we had 33%, 38% of our kids were in virtual school. They weren't even in the buildings. So that's why that cost is lower for 2021. But even so, if you look at Bay Road and JL Kane compared to that number, significantly different. So that's an annual cost for those two combined buildings versus a new school, a new facility that we would be looking at on a regular basis. Can you go back to that one more time? Yep. Let me just for a second. I just want to make sure. Okay. Yep. What is, okay, so the new student total at, on, at St. John's would be roughly 600 students? 600. Because it's 530 now. Six, six, at 100. At, yeah, so 630. Mm -hmm. And how many are at um, Bay Road and Kane on average? Yeah, how many, how many students are at Kane? Your, your Kane was showing, I want to say, Five, five twenty. Last check, five twenty. So, this is just my back of the envelope math here. So right now, it's costing fourteen thousand nine hundred dollars per student at at Rosenwald to per student. That's the cost per student. Yep. If you divide the number of students by the total cost. Correct. Per yep. And JL Kane, we're spending six thousand two hundred. That is correct. So we're we're spending double the amount per student. Yes. At Rosemont. Correct. And really, if you look at them one more time, it's about not for yeah. I mean, Rosewall, but I mean, for St. Th John. Th this year will be a better year to look at because we've been in our buildings all year long. We still dealt with COVID, but we've been in our buildings all year long. Whereas 2021, we were not in our buildings. <coughs> but you're going to save over $2 million anyway, look at it. Every year. Every year. 
All right, where's the money coming from? Right now, uh, the district has a capital fund reserve of $19,200,000, approximate thousand dollars. So that is money that we have that is there. Um, and it is dedicated to buildings and renovations. Where, where did that money come from? Okay. Can you explain that and so, why we have so much? So a couple things. Over time, um, that is um, the board doing a good job of budgeting and, and being frugal with their money. And really, COVID has a lot to do with this because we got a lot of federal money for ESSER funds that we were able to spend on other things that we would normally spend on this money. So for example, computers, technology. We're allowed to spend a lot of money, a lot of our ESSER money on technology. Normally, we would spend it out of these funds. Technology would be capital funds? Yep. There's yep. replacement of one-to-one yep. -one -one technology. Yep. So, so every year, we're buying X amount of laptops and X amount of iPads for students. Normally, it would come out of the capital funds we hadn't had to do that for the past couple of years. So well, that's HVAC also, right? That's correct. I'm gonna, with my superintendent's update, I'll talk a little bit about that. So, all right, bonds available for other, for building projects. Where This is $16.4 million. Where is this coming from? We get uh, what they call 8% monies every year in order to maintain our buildings, okay? And 8% is basically 8% of your total property value, okay? We're allowed to borrow that money against tax receipts, okay? So so basically, it's, it's, it's like a loan that the money is fronted, but when the tax bills are paid, we pay the loan off. So every year, we are allowed to utilize 8% monies, and, it, and you're supposed to. The, 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 the legislators put that in place for school districts to be able to take care of the buildings. Remember I talked about the 20 years worth and replacing all those systems? That's exactly what 8% money is supposed to be used for. And technology, okay? Well, why haven't we been using that 8% money all along on St. John's? I mean, why, how did it get in such bad shape? the whole district. That's, that's the entire district. I know, but I'm just saying, like, is there, are there things that we could have been doing along we, we with We have. I mean, years? the budget that we do every year, we, we do that in advance. I mean, she produces that sheet. You've seen it. You just not yeah. don't think remember what it looks like. But every year we go over that eight percent money and plan it in advance of what we're spending and all the maintenance needs. And most of the time we got more needs than we have money. But right. I guess what my point is is that are there thing are there things we could have done along the way at some of these renovations, or is this a once you start you got to do them all kind of renovations on like well, a building like that? I, I think the reality is is that money was probably an issue at one time. We didn't have that much money available to us. That's that's what the unique time frame is right now, is that we have money and we need to take advantage of it while we can to take care of as many of our kids as we can. We did because that money's not always here. That eight percent money. Yep. Remember that a few years back? Yep. That was, and the eight percent that's what did Brockington's renovation. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so so you know big renovation or medium-sized renovations of taking care of your facilities. Yep. So I don't think it's right. that the board didn't do what they should have done. I think they did everything they could with the money they had in front of them. We're just in a really unique situation right now. I think Charles mentioned Mayo was another project that we did with that. With eight percent money? Yep. Yeah. And, 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 and remember the value is higher now because we had a reassessment. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so the same level of taxes that people are paying so that is directly from taxpayer money. It right? is. That is. That is. Uh, is that capital. how we deal with the new elementary schools? How do no, that, that was with the bond referendum. That's, that's, that's the penny sales tax. All right. But but, but totally I, I, I guess back to my question on why didn't we do some of this? Because this didn't accumulate. I mean, you may have like this year rolled over 1.5 million. You know, this is an accumulation over years. multiple years. So yes. I mean, it wasn't like we could go in and <clears throat> fix. You know, it, it, this is like your savings account that you saved up, and now you're going to go buy a new car. Mm -hmm. It didn't appear in one year. It's a right. multiple years. Of, and, 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 and so that 8%, again, we, we were level on that amount. That's, that's not increased over the past couple of years. It's not going to increase this year. So, you know, so it you, takes several years to save. To build up that money. That's correct. 
and, and now we've not used all of our capacity for 8% money. But that would require us charging more taxes to use more of that 8% money. And, and we're not going to do that. So, you know, they're, 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 every, every school district has a ceiling on how much 8% money they can use. But that directly impacts the taxpayers of those school districts. We are holding our steady. Because, again, we can plan. You know, I, I would rather have it steady than have it low one year and the next year up here and then low one year and the next year here. It's better business practices to keep that steady so our taxpayers don't see any change to their tax bills. Gotcha. Okay. Now, there, there used to be a time that you could, the school district could go in and just say, we need to do this. And you could just do anything you wanted to do. So the legislature went in and changed that. I got you. But the, like the three elementary schools, that was a, a referendum that our voters had to vote on. And so that was $60 million that, that the taxpayers had to say, we're gonna, we're gonna pay a penny tax to pay for these three schools. So where would that $40 million come from to renovate like St. John's? It's not there. Well, that, that's, this is our source of funds. Yeah, it's yeah. not Whether there. We use that's it for this and build something different. Is, we, we've got 35-6 available. And so, if you remember from my prior conversation at the last board meeting, we can build a school for about $29 million, a new facility that would accommodate all these students. And again, we can build this now and not have to raise taxes at all. Correct. And use the excess funds to continue again on all the other schools in the district, which is where we need to put it. Okay. So to your point, what about the other buildings, right? Because we have other buildings that have needs. Right. You know, if you look at Pate, Pate is an old school, narrow hallways, small classrooms, bad electrical. I mean, on and on. I mean, any building in our district that was built in the 50s, they're all over the place. Those are what we have to stay focused and targeted on as we can. But again, this is the highest priority because this is the most neat. And this board years ago, before he came, superintendents ago had made a decision back when we did the referendum. The reason why we did the referendum, we hadn't spent that much money, but they were ignored for umpteen years prior to that. So we said, let's get them there, but let's use this 8% money so we don't have to go back through this again, and we'll replace the buildings. And that's when we started doing these building plans. Yes, they'll change, but we got to have a game plan. So that was a game plan where it was prior to the 12, and then the 12, and then the 19, and just kind of updating it. <coughs> So, again, I, I think when we're talking, what's best for, for kids? I know there's a lot of other factors that are involved, but first and foremost, what's, we have to be focused on what's best for our children, what the needs of our students to be successful. We have absolute proof by the three new elementary schools that we built that our children can have a better environment. And three schools are experiencing that now. As a parent, I would really have to question why my child can't experience the same. And it's not because of a bright shiny, it's because of opportunities. It's because of children being in an environment where they feel Value, not that they don't feel valued where they are. They do. The adults do an awesome job, but you can't tell me walking into one building versus walking into that new building is the same environment. And so that that is the, the key pieces here. Now, do we have sentimental buildings in communities that we need to be uh, very focused on how can they potentially give back to the community? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have to be focused on the buildings in our communities and, and finding value to give back to the communities. But um, so can I just say, interrupt you for a second right there? So the, the repurposing suggestions, I mean, bringing other schools there, in the, I mean, does, 
would we use those, if we if we built this new elementary and we left St. John's and Rosenwald buildings, would we put other students in those buildings no, in our district? We would not. We would not. But, for example, for historical buildings, there's a tremendous amount of grant money out there for developers. Um, and, and so you see this happening across small town USA right now, where the, the, the funds are available for economic development for certain types of buildings. These buildings fit that bill. Um, that's where we really need to hear from our communities about what would, be, because there's, there, there's, one, there's one myth out there, and that is that schools are responsible for economic revenues, and they are not. We're, we don't pay taxes. Um, what drives economic growth is business. And so, and then when there's economic growth in business, they demand good schools. So, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, there's only so much we can do because we don't pay anything. We, we, we employ teachers and employees. And so, I think what, what we really need to be focused on is number one, what's best for our students. And then once we get past what's best for our students, if the next step is what's best for our communities, then we need to work hand in hand with our communities on how to get economic development and revenues generated. <clears throat> Any other questions? Maybe. I had a lot of questions for you, but you answered just about every one of them. So I don't think I have any more questions for you. Um, Okay, so this is, not, this is a question I, I've gotten a lot. So when was the last time we did any, any kind of significant renovations at St. John's Elementary? 1986. Okay. Now, we replaced roofs. We had termite damage three years ago when I walked in the door and had to tear out a bunch of beams because they were rotten. Uh, you know, we've done repairs. But as far as major renovations to what Mr. Carter was referring to with the windows, um, 1986. We did some renovations in auditorium. In I'm sorry, thank you. The auditorium was 2014. Thank you. And I should have had a picture of the auditorium because the auditorium is beautiful. At but St. not John's. used. But not used. Yeah, and it's, again, 2014, it, you, you're walking into a different world when you go from the main hallway in St. John's and walk into the auditorium. It's beautiful, it a great job with it. And, and we try to utilize it as much as we can for events. I, that, that we need to continue that tradition of regardless of what happens with that building. But if you had done, I mean, that 1986 renovation, Mr. Carter, was, was that the level, that was the grade two one? Is that the one you were talking about? Um, it was a totally different code in the um, 1980s. Uh, the IBC, International Building Code, did not come out until 2000. And so this was done under the old Southern Building Code. Okay. And, and I was not involved in that, so I'm, I'm not really sure what was done. But again, the OSF would grandfather it in. Uh, ADA was... Uh, uh, um, um, American Disabilities Act it was not uh, thought of at that time. So there was when, a lot of things. When was the code that after you get to a certain point, percentage point, that you then had to bring everything up to code? That didn't occur until 2000 when the uh, International Building Code was adopted by the United States. Okay. So I ask you about, you told me that the you renovated a, a school book on case. That was a high school? Yes, ma'am. Now, how many elementary schools have you built um, that were two or three stories? The, the only one, it wasn't renovated for an elementary school. Um, we, we moved the children out of that school, and after they were built a new school, and after that was in Batesburg, Leesville. And actually, it was probably around the 2000. Eight vintage, much much like your your original building was. Um, Who did Royale? 
I'm not sure, but but it, it, it basically Leesville, we went back and renovated that building into administrative offices for their for the district. Uh, they were I think they were in a house before that, and so anyway, they by far outgrown it. So while you're standing, just another question. Just want to kind of clear up there. So we paid you to do this study. Do you does Jumper Carter Seas have a dog in this fight? What, based, what decision we make? It sounds like we'd be paying you a whole lot more money to go in and renovate it yeah, our fees than we would, would be, to because of the complexity of the project. Our fees would be a lot higher on on this renovation than it would be on a new school, okay. especially if it was decided out where we got the plans and, okay. and and we would typically bid out projects too. So you know, again, <coughs> as a as a consultant. As a neutral consultant, they can put this together, but it's a bid process to go through all that. I, if so, and I'm just going to, Liam, this may be in your stack, too. I mean, I mean, I know the concern, one of the concerns probably in the community is that what will we do with that building? I mean, if we have all the issues with renovations, would someone else, if that building was repurposed for some other purpose, would it run into similar things, or because we are unique at being a school, you have school all these ADA, like you've got to cut, and you've got class sizes that have to be a certain size, you have to have bathrooms, you've got to have, I mean, is, is there a different, if someone was coming in to repurpose that building, except for a school, right? would it cost as much as what it, it would cost us to bring that building into code? And, and that depends. So as far as what could the building be used for to meet code, um, it could be used for, um, and I'm going to get my R's, my residentials mixed up, but uh, I think it's the R2 and R3. One of those is like hotels. The other one would be um, apartment type buildings um, or, or condominiums or whatever. Uh, so those would be uh, acceptable uses and then also business occupancies. Um, so, so if, if a business wanted to move in there, you could certainly do that, be it you know, attorney's offices, whatever it may be, um, could be that uh, utilized But would that. they run into these the same cost issues uh, that we're hitting? Some of, of those, yes. Uh, you know, again... I mean, the mold, the mold remediation, but, I mean, right. but, but we would eliminate the over ADA stuff that we have to have as far as bathrooms and all the Bathrooms and all the classrooms. Bathrooms and all the classrooms. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's just say it became a business. Yeah. Uh, a business may be able to, to, to utilize the tools you have because in a uh, school facility, um, we figure um, um, uh, 20 square feet per one child. In a um, business occupancy, it's 100 square feet. For, per person. So you wouldn't have the total need for the, the numbers of toilets. If it became, you know, repurposed into some other business, let's just say, if it was apartments, then that's a total different ballgame. Right. I mean, obviously, each apartment yeah. has to have a bathroom. Correct. Right? But, um, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is there are certain, we are bound by certain things that, that, right. that increase our cost. Yes. Beyond what we would, schools are expensive to build. Yeah, and and I think just like Dr. Newman said, um, you know, if you repurpose it for some other businesses or hotels or whatever it may be, apartments, there are federal monies out there to help reduce that cost and push it way down to where it becomes affordable for someone to renovate. We don't have access to that money. Do not. Again, that's about stimulating the economy. And again, as so Dr. Newman really said, it, you know, when you buy, when you build a school, that property comes off of the tax books. And if we were to combine the school, there would no, no loss of jobs, right? No, no positions. Absolutely not. You got to have, you still got to have people to teach kids. You still got to have aides. Um, you, you, you basically, if you have a larger entity. You still need the people to answer phones. You've got to have administrative assistants. You've got to have cafeteria staff to accommodate the extra kids. I mean, custodians. We didn't, we didn't lose. We didn't lose personnel by combining Kane or Bay Road. 
or Lamar Spalding. Lamar Spalding. Yeah. All three, there were zero jobs lost. There was one person out of all three of those schools that did a different job than what they had before we built the school. Just one employee. Uh, and they're now back in the same job that they were in as but, at the beginning of this year. I'll say the middle school portion of uh, Rosenwald, where would those teachers go? Uh, they would go teach at another school. Uh, another so they would school. still have a job as a teacher. Okay. They would just go teach at Darlington Middle School. Okay. Okay, so again, community meetings, uh, input. We're going to do all this again at a community meeting? I'm going to do a condensed version. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do the, the speed version and condense it down. Um, so, but it will obviously be available for people to look at. And, um, are we going to stream those too, or are we going to just pile people in to do pile it? Pile people in. I want to see people in person. Is this going to be a question and answer? Is this going to be input uh, from the? I mean, what has it, this going to? It's just know more yet? people expressing themselves, having time to talk about how they feel about it. What are the potentials? What you're going to present first and hope the answer is as much as possible. Absolutely. I'll do a mini say, version of this. I, mean, I, I just got to say, I'm a little disappointed at, that there weren't more people here tonight to voice their opinion because they have been a lot of loud voices on social media. And one one person here, and I applaud him for being here to, um, to speak, is what yep. I'm saying. More than one person here to speak. From Darlington. From Darlington. Oh, yeah. Right. For either. Just in gen for either. Yeah. For either. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, we have Rosenwald had, I mean, Mr. Judge Byron I might be the only St. John's person here, and I think everybody else may have been from Rosenwald. Yeah. Well, like you know, the mayor said, you know, Rosenwald is family. Yeah. There's a lot of history there. I mean, there's a lot of history at St. John's, too, but I'm just disappointed that we didn't hear from more. I don't, I don't think the board at all disagrees with it not being historical and, and not being sympathetic to the community's you know, history with that at all. Our job, though, is to analyze it. We have to weigh that with the cost and what's best for the student, whether it be you know, from an educational standpoint, uh, extracurricular activities, whatever it is. Um, I, I just think sometimes we do a disservice. So our job is to do a service to the kids by analyzing. And this is part of the process. It's a long process, which is, again, the questions asked and having the different people to ask those questions. Um, but again, the next step is to, to hear back from the community. Very important, and then match that with the information that we've got that is factual, and we got to make a decision what's the best route to go. But my only thing is, if, at minimum, based on what Mr. Carter presented, without knowing having any conversation with OSF, I mean, we could be close to fifty thousand dollars. Fifty million. I mean, that's that's two thirds of the way to a fifty million. Excuse me, fifty million. I mean, that would have been if we're talking thirty million to build a new school. That's two thirds of the way to build another school in another area in this district. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, so so, so I, I'm I'm having a hard time understanding the justification of how we would spend fifty million dollars. And that was just on one school. Correct, on one yeah. school. That would be. Pretty when you could spend ten million more. And, and then what's your end product when you actually finish what they do? I mean, from a functionality standpoint. And then again, back to the operational. I mean, how much more efficient is that upfit relative to a new facility? Yeah. So, you know, again, I want to see the academic side. I want to see the, the, the impact on the kids first, okay? And that's the question we've been talking about outside of this. And, that's, and then the numbers, I say, would be secondary. Numbers are secondary. First of all is what benefit, how do the children benefit, the students benefit more is a, is a number one priority I think about. And then secondly, let's see how that fits in. After you put that into play, then what are the numbers look like? We kind of got the numbers now, so we hope to hear more about it. And I, and I think a, you know, a couple of our principals at those new buildings can talk about what that looks like now, too. Okay. And, and I think that would be interesting to yeah. us and to the public. Just oh. opportunities for kids. Yeah. Yeah. And we certainly can address that. Okay. Okay. Good. Mr. Carter, thank you for coming, Joel. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Okay. Appreciate it. Hope you're back, all right? Stay. I, I thought that was, was a cover bun. I wasn't sure if it was my form. It was my form. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on? I think we pretty much got those hashed out. 
Okay, moving on to uh, superintendent's update. Yep. Uh, one second now. Okay. I was going to turn off your screen. Yep. We'll turn the screen off so that everybody's not staring at our money figure here. Mm -hmm. so the, the remote's right there. If you'll just the white remote, the white remote, mm -hmm. and then hit power. Um, first and foremost, the, a lot of conversations about the new funding model uh, that the Ways and Means Committee, um, as well as the governor, has put out. And we've been trying to crunch through numbers and see how that impacts us. Um, I, again, I think it's very important for everybody to understand uh, when the governor originally came out, the legislators talked about a $4,000 increase for teachers. Um, that is not exactly what they're doing, okay? And so, at least at the moment, that's not exactly what they're doing. We hope to see some revisions to this, but what they, what, what, where the $4,000 comes into play is, right now, the minimum salary schedule starts at $36,000. And so any district that currently starting salary is $36,000, the state is giving them money to bring them up to 40. Okay? It's the same thing with our district, but our minimum salary is 39,000 already because the board took the initiative to be the best paying district in the PD, sending a strong message for our teachers. So unfortunately, we would only get the difference between thirty-nine and forty thousand dollars at this point in time, based off the current funding formula. So I know a lot of people out there are hearing four thousand dollars, and I really don't know how this is going to get reconciled at the state level. But <coughs> I do need to make sure that everybody understands the details of that are. It's the minimum salary scale that's being brought up to forty thousand. So our veteran teachers would not see any of that four thousand. They would see a thousand dollars. So they're going to increase the sell of every year for every teacher, whatever it takes to bring it up to forty thousand. Okay, mm -hmm. and every sell above that. Just like we did when we did our job. Okay, so she yes. shift everything. Everything would shift one up. Step. That's right. So everything shifts up. In in this case, what's proposed right now, it would, they would give us the money to pay a thousand dollars more for every teacher. Okay. Now, but in a district that that was their base was thirty six. They would boost them. Everybody gets a four thousand. Every, dollars everybody in that district gets a four thousand dollars. And so we get penalized because we, we were proactive. Correct. That is correct. And that is the sticking point that I've talked with our legislators about as well, is that we were proactive trying to help uh, teacher pay, and, and it seems like we're being penalized now. Well, I mean, I, really, I wouldn't call it being penalized. I would say that our teachers have benefited for more years of making that money. They did, but our budget was penalized because that came right. out of our pocket relative. Oh, uh, because they didn't fund the state. They didn't fund it. We funded that. Yeah, because that's another point I'd like to make too yeah. is that the state dictates that we do things sometimes, yeah. but then doesn't fund. That's a called lot of unfunded times. mandates. Unfunded yeah. mandates. A lot of stuff. <laughs> which is what we're doing. Again, for the people right. in the back, unfunded mandates. Unfunded mandates. So, a question, yes. okay, I, I think we, we did all this when we, Ms. Renee and you were reevaluating re all the pay scales and all like that. So we've caught up all the teachers that were at the starting thing of 36 through the years and then they've been bumped up to where they should be or what we elevated them to? Yes. Okay. So, so, so when we made those adjustments, you know, it's not, you all, your starting point is starting salary. That's what you base yeah. it off. But, but every cell increases above that. 
Okay. And we've well, fixed also, all that now where it's all relative, right? It, it is. Yeah. So okay. we're at 39000 and then we also have a $1,000 uh, first year signing mentoring right? signing for our, our new teachers that are first year teachers. Not new to the district, but first year teaching in the profession. There's another thousand dollars that that brings them to forty. But but again, I mean, you probably saw Greenville in the news recently. That their starting salary is forty one thousand six hundred dollars. So they're not getting anything. They're not getting anything from the state for increasing teacher salaries. Um, and, and I will say, there's very few districts out there right now that pay thirty six thousand dollars for starting salary. Very few. There are a few, but not many. So I, I think what that means that, that for the majority of school districts out there, we're not getting funded what the PR message is out there. Because yeah. they were out of touch. All the districts were tired of it. They couldn't recruit, couldn't get anything. We kept waiting on the state to do it. It didn't happen. So all the districts tried to find a ways within their budgets to do it. A lot of them, as he said, did it. And they aren't getting the full impact of what they're saying they're going to do. So they don't have the playing field automatically to some degree, right? Well, it, it is, but when but you it's start... Not, it's not fair. Don't get wrong. Yeah, when you start thinking like cost of living and you start oh, yeah. thinking of, you know, all the other things that, that if, again, if our board is committed for us being the highest paying district in the PD, we're yeah. almost not allowed to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it you know, they're limiting us, so, essentially. So they will forevermore fund that additional money, or you think at some point they'll take the bill? Oh, no, it's yeah. very fair. Yeah. It's reoccurring money. So, so what they're saying is we're going to bring everybody. Essentially, they're saying every teacher in South Carolina will make at least forty thousand dollars a year. For, we'll make, we, salary. the state, will make up the difference for those that are not yeah. currently. That's we, we, wherever you are. Yeah. Wherever you are. That's right. So the few that were still at thirty-six, they'll get four. Those of us that were already thirty-nine, we'll get one. And those yeah. that were above, such as Green, will get nothing. Right. So we want to stay the highest in the PD. We're going to have to up ours. To whatever, 42, 43, whatever. Just food for thought. Yep. So, but, but these are things that are going on that I'm, I'm hoping that it's, uh, it's not finalized at this point, that these concerns are being heard, um, and, and that they need to think about, if you're really trying to increase salaries for everybody relative, let's increase them for everybody, not just the minimum. Um, so, uh, we'll be getting more information on that. I, I know that uh, Ms. Douglas has been in a lot of meetings about it. We're continuing to get information. Uh, we'll have an update uh, at the uh, work session that we have for March as far as the budget calendar and update on budgets. Um, the other thing that, that uh, kind of alludes back to our HVAC conversation are, are we do have uh, preliminary approval for our ESSER three plan which is approximately 39 million dollars total um, but that's all right um, but we did you know we've been waiting for approval for a while on this we were going back and forth and so we finally got preliminary approval um, and it's what's included in there is the Omer Gym HVAC in Hartsville as well as the district office HVAC project, that's all wrapped into ESSER monies, which frees up those monies in capital to be spent on something else. So just know that we, we are utilizing that money that will free up more capital money as well. So for example, more technology than we originally had in the plan, but that just means we're not paying that technology out of capital. We can use that for some other for capital so we're working through that um, and then a couple uh, positive notes we, we uh, this Thursday and Friday we have a uh, we have a PD day on Thursday and then Friday our schools are closed for school personnel and students obviously students won't be there on Thursday either what is a PD? What is that? Professional development. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry. Sorry. So, I was thinking PD like P E D E. Gotcha, <laughs> okay. gotcha. PD. Okay. We have all these acronyms right, tonight, right, right. so. Uh, but no, it's we we've got two days. <laughs> day. Teachers have day teachers have two days without students. Schools okay. have two days without students, and of course, school personnel uh, will not be working on Friday. That that's kind of like a summer day that we move from the summer into the school year in order to give a break. 
Um, so looking forward to that. And um, on Thursday uh, at the Hartsville Arena, we are going to be doing Orange Frog uh, professional development, which is fun, fun, fun for about 400 of our employees um, on Thursday. So that that is a you know, wide swath of different employees across the district. You know, bus drivers, food service teachers, TAs, you name it. Um, but it will be um, a, a, a very joyful day is what I can say based on what we've experienced. Now, I've been talking about it for two years. I know that y'all are tired of hearing about Orange, but I think no, you'll be I hearing, like you're going to hear a lot more about it after uh, after Thursday. So that's my superintendent's report. For okay. Question? Anyone? All right. Board member input. James. Good. Carl. Oh. Richard. I'm good. Wanda. Oh, I'm good. I've said enough tonight. Go ahead, Warren. Ask your question. One question. Go ahead, Warren. Ask your Warren. Ahead, Warren. Uh, remember, your ethics reports need to be in, I think, at the end of this month. That's a good one. Yes. Oh, but what are, and, and they have created a new, there's a new website. Yeah. And you have to create a new password. And you've got to create a new, I mean, it's, it's yeah. a little more, it's a little trickier than it was in previous years, just we, FYI. We were told it was not very user friendly to huh? allow more than five minutes to go in and do yeah, it. Well, it, it times yeah, it, you out if you don't get it all done quickly. Yeah, it, it, it was not, it's not necessarily user friendly. Yeah. So, so don't wait till the last minute, I think. Yeah. Correct. But it's the same website there, right? It's the same. Well, it actually, I have link. no idea how it's the same to link right that you, it links you yeah, into a new right web. I get a fine every year regardless. And you've got to do a whole new password. I know, but I don't know which one it is. I always file the wrong thing. I thought I did what I was supposed to do, and they just sent me a fine. <laughs> and remember, open house next Sunday at Bay Road in Cambridge. Yep. Two to four. And you didn't ask her one question. I need vacancies. He's waiting on it. <laughs> he, he's been waiting for five, four hours for that question. <laughs> he's ready to go. We, we're ready. He's Sorry. got you. I don't even have to ask the question. What is it? I have no idea. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> 21. 21. Yes, sir. So um, looking pretty good going into next year. Principals are actively recruiting. We, uh, we went to a fair this past Tuesday and got two um, <coughs> teachers signed letters of commitment with us. So. Right so is that window of, of turning back into contracts, is that closed? Is that done? No. no it's just started. Yeah. It's just started. Yeah, okay. it's, the it's the busy season. Started. It's the busy season. We'll have much, much better, more accurate numbers for you next meeting. Okay. And they do have day at the Capitol on, I think, April 27th, if anybody cares to go. Okay. That's all I've got. Personnel action. Uh, we accept the administration's recommendations with their dental. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Let's have it. Second session. I will be going to executive session and discuss personnel and contractual matters. Second. I'll second. Discussion on that. I will favor the motion to go into executive session to discuss personnel matters and contractual matters. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Let's have it.
That's enough, Phil. We're now back in open session. Dr. Dawson made a motion to come out, seconded by Lucas. And uh, I'll entertain any uh, motions. Uh, Lauren, I've got two motions. The first is I move that we direct the administration to make a formal complaint to the State Board of Education regarding a professional employee's breach of contract. I'll second. Second. Discussion on that? I want to favor the motion. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Okay. And second, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the district's recommendation for the head coach position at Lamar High School. Head football coach. Head, yeah, head football coach. Second. Second. Okay. Discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. I move that we adjourn. I move we adjourn. I would favor the motion to adjourn. Aye. Aye. Stand adjourned. Thank y'all.